The last one that was there was around the 1920s, was it? 1930? 1928? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was mostly women you'd have at that market, was it? Any other agent there that used to come from Belenay? That's the fella, that's the fella. You come around the English thinking after you, but the English was the foreman of the accused at the time you were coming. You never saw any of that there? No. So, you must have been down there, were you? Yes, I was. That's where you lived in the, uh, the class, was it? Yeah. Well, I didn't have the sports down there. Yeah. before he came then, was it? Yeah. The TV. And this here is Martin Tahar's Sheebin, or was. Today it is the property of Patrick Scanlon, Caramoa, Sheebin. Post office. Did you ever hear of uh, Mike Vase? I think. I think they got the Yeah. Hey, been there at first Paddy Scanlon. I did. He was in Madden Tower, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. That's his last in my mother. Quite a Yeah. Yes, I read in the day of 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 the day Yeah. Was he going for America in the morning, as they say? Yeah, he was. He was. Oh, yeah, I was with him. Yeah. That's the Nothing seems by another danger. Yeah. Could be classed. There's a man's document. Maybe Kelly might be pretty. Yeah. So it was around then, was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And uh, how did they dispose of the body? I don't think it was ever found, did they? Oh, did it? It was over the store of the rest of the and then brought in. You might say, well, I don't know what they all look for. You don't think they can do your job, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't throw it in the back of the stick branch, did they? Yeah, I know. Of course, they didn't. They didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's the Macbeth Hill. And this, in front of us here, is Macbeth Hill. Called after John Macbeth, who lived in here on the left. And this is the site of his house, in here on the left. Across from 
children in the townland of Caramore. There's a storeroom and a kind of storage here and a dwelling house. And on the right hand side of the road here, that's his dairy. Oh, that was it now, dear. That, that, that one. It well, was a new one, that was brand new, but that was it. Did you re roof it again now? Yeah. Well, I didn't think it was roof. So what place are you looking at? Stay looking, it was dangerous, I think, you know. Hey. 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 So that was it? Yeah. And it was a, there was an old mill down there. There was a fellow who were walking, you see. There were two who were walking across the other side. That was yeah. The other side of the, that's the, see the bank on the fair side of them there? Yeah. Well, that was the mill right behind that bank, and it was going down there. The mill was there somewhere, you know. Yeah. And the river was, was, was going down in that, mill, that, that day. What kind of a mill do you think it was? I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Cardinal well, Black. Probably for Cardinal, because you see the, the, the two wheels. There was one wheel up. There's one wheel down there in our field, covered, it's covered with size. Yeah. And there's another one down in Paddy Scandon's field, up a bit there, by Venus. Yeah. yeah. And they're probably Cardinal, you know, because they were... Yeah. There were, 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 there didn't the bank buy it? Or didn't the land commission buy it from the bank or something? Well, they all joined up or something like yeah. that. And the land commission yeah. bought it for the land and bought it. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> the man was gone bankrupt or something. Yeah. I think the bank was, was going to sell it. Okay. So the, 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 they asked the land commission to step in and buy it for them. Yeah. So there'd be more than your father involved? There was a lot of work involved before that, right? Yeah. There was a lot of driving cattle off and all that. Oh, yeah. So I am still around. Call Lily if you want to know. I need to send him to one. Yeah. Cast. Cast. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Kishadley. Yeah. William Adley. Right. What's William Adley involved? Yeah. Bairn Hill or something. No, he was some kind of... Oh, he was a bailiff on the land. He was a bailiff for them. And he he tried to take over the land or something to get it, you know, on the on the home somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I think they must have tumbled to it, you know, that he was doing it. And I think they... Well, the cat laughed or something, didn't they? Yeah. So, and, and I went to the bank and bought it, you know. Yeah. I went to the land commission. Yeah. Got the land commission to buy it. Yeah. Forgotten. The land was in the too, you know what? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was in the old school house. Yeah, the school, yeah. Yeah, on the way back there. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't say, you get mad drunk, you know. And, uh, what's it was a name now? Was it Mood or something they called it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. There's some name on it, you know. Uh, this is one of these. Right. He probably caused his downfall in the inn. Well, when we were young there, that house was there, or that, 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 that the thing the road wasn't down it. Yeah. And all, I, all the bit. Yeah. I, I bought a load of them, we yeah. bought a load of them stones out for a chair to get into stop putting in drains and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah a few was able to get up the fire. You said that the molasses are local people, it wasn't the land commissioner that the Ah, no, no, no. I'll take them bits out of them. No, they get them. Yeah. 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 I suppose when Tony Cairn, if we got it all, I suppose they bought, was the roof on that thing when Tony Cairn got it? It was, yeah. How long ago, have you any idea, would that be, that they made that deal? Oh, 1922, wasn't it? Or something? Yeah. Yeah. Before, before 1922, before this house was built here, anyway. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and this house, my father came living here, you see, yeah. he, was, he was living in Penalahan. And uh, he, he came living here and they built that house. Yeah. So it was around that time, you know, they got the yeah. land. Around yeah. 1920, I think, it's still Yeah. This here is the wicked, the servant's entrance up to Caramore House. Now the people of Bohol that worked in Caramora State came up across the marsh here, up these fields, crossed over the road here, and into this wicket, servant's entrance, and up the lawn, uh, Caramora House. And this here is the wicket, once it had a red door, now the colour is different, it has a cheaper model. Now up this lawn. Caramore House. Once the home of the town has been the farmers and now Robbie Buckley's there. 
Paramore House. In 1830 years, it was the home of Roger Palmer. Around 1641, the end of the past before I I'm not sure who built the present day house. Samuel Crozier McCormick, the lawyer, must have, uh, but he was here before 1898, and he wasn't here in 1856. Samuel was born in 1852 and died in 1911. He lived to be 79 years. He is buried in Rafan Senator. Uh, he was also involved in the history of Kerala with H.C. Buck in sorting out the Kirkwood dispute. This was a profitable adventure for both lawyers and disasters for the Kirkwoods. Sam had a son called Nile. He also lived up here. He was a farmer. He gave much employment to the people of Coval and Blackham. He offered much assistance to the farmers by lending uh, them horses and shifters and hay cutting machines and other uh, barnyard tools. Those who were obliged by him were paid in some ways by giving an odd day's labor saving on the house. He also gave away medicines and cures for uh, cattle and animals and also people uh, and with much success. He also started and got going the Lacken Pipe or, uh, the Lacken Pipe Band. They had bag pipes, side drums, kettle drums and the big drum. Members were Philip Laden who was pipe major, Willie Needham, Donald McCormick, Patrick Needham, Harry Brady, Willie Boyd, Willie Buck, Ned Gorman, Sonny Buck and Mickey McHale. This band reached a high standard when I remember all the times they played and how well they paraded in comparison with the army bands I've seen parading at Salt Hill festivals over 25 years ago. This band was in existence from about 1943 until 1950. They performed at local football matches, Berenay, Fashion and Memorials in Bellicastle. Uh, many of the members in later years drank too much, something which Dale McCormick was totally opposed to. It brought to an end the lack of high band eventually. Nile was the sole uh, promoter and organizer of the band. I can remember Nile as a benevolent man in the community, for which he is not well remembered today. In 1838, there were 24 families in this townland of Caramoa. In 1856, there were only seven families. The famine, in one way or another, got rid of 17 families. Today, there are only four families here, including the McCormick. And this here is Caramore House, a typical landlord's house, probably built by the Palmers, later home of McCormick, and now Robbie Burke is there. And this is the lawn, and over there in the distance is the new house, in which uh, resides Donald McCormick and family. And here was the main entrance, Caramore Gates, into Caramore House, and the avenue leading up to it. There's another view of the New house built by Donald McCormick, modern day dwelling. And here is the cemetery in which. Um, Samuel Crozier McCormick, Lies and the Sun Nile. Um, born 1832, Samuel died 1911, and uh, Nile is not so long buried there. Uh, 1980, Nile Cemetery, where they are. Levin Pipe Band. Philip Levin was Pipe Major. Niall McCormick, the promoter. Willie Needham of Kiligary. Ned Gorman of Kerala, who was an army drummer at one time. Donald McCormick, Caramoa. Sonny Buck of Castle Lacken, who was the big drummer. Patrick Needham of Kiligary. 
Michael McHale of Mrs. Brown, who are beside Drummer. Paddy Brady of Mrs. Brown. And Willie Buck of Bela Salah. Who has now departed. Black and Pipe Band. Organised by Niall McCormick of Cannonball. On the left here is the Caramore estate and uh, on the right is Rathlachy, the port of Rathlachy, one time property of Hammers. You can see that wall on the left there, the Caramore estate, McCormick Lands. And there is the view of Rathlachy. This road was made, I think, in the 1920s. And uh, on the left of this river that runs down here to the bushes is, is a drone. Left of that wall there. And over here is Paramore Townland. But it is called after this fort over here, Bratford's Lawn. Which would mean the fort of the Breslin probably occupied by a Breslin family in olden times. Now about 200 yards towards uh, the strand down here was an old village which disappeared during famine time. You can see the track of the river there. It was there in 1838, seven or eight houses, and in 1856 they had disappeared. Probably disappeared during the famine years. This uh, townland extended up here by this river, away up here, northwards towards, not northwards but westwards towards Baden Hill. It's an area of furs and bushes and rough land. It goes away up here as far as I can. This is called Ravishland, although it is Caramore townland. And this road over here now is reasonably new. Now, this is where we are now. That is the northern uh, end of the townland. And that point there points out the river that we were looking at going through the bushes a few minutes ago. It runs all the way down to meet the Clonallan River. On the left side of that was the uh, Edison Drone. And this is the new road made, I suppose, around the 1920s, I'm not too sure. Now, at this turn here, I think it met with the ancient road coming down from Baden Hill. And down there, it is all wooded and uh, full of bushes today. But there is an ancient road up there somewhere. And down ahead here is the Caramore House, uh, farther east than the bushes. Then here to the left, went down the old roadway to the village down by the river that disappeared during famine times. And further down there is Rat Bristown, the Brazilian port. See there's a track of a roadway there, going down to the old village which no longer exists. Now that old village was down where these trees are growing in the distance there and full bushes. Uh, 
further over is the woodland up. Down there is the site of some old houses and foundations and relics. And uh, Paddy McHale tells me that uh, an old roadway went down by that river coming out at Caligari, Caramol boundary. Probably used to serve the villagers that lived here at one time. land all around here, over as far as the river on the left, belonged to Thomas Cormac. Now many of the Kiligiri people own it. Now, it went out, had a more town, it went out to meet that river we saw there in the distance, called Clunalham River, where it flows into Lacken Strand. And up here is the west side. Uh, rough country, grazing land, full of furs. Mm. Now, right of this uh, shed at the strand was a two-storied house. It was one time a yeoman barracks and later on a post office, around 1920. there would be roughly about the situation of it. Now after 1920 the post office wasn't there anymore. It was up in Karamoa, in the old house. This is the new post office and this was the site on the left here of the old post office around 1920 or there about. Uh, the post office was there across where people call it where McGordon's barrels are shed yeah, today. The post office was in McGordon's old house there, Carl. I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't remember it either. I only remember it in the, in the present house. That is now rich. Uh, before that, the fellow left the stand on for the Belsha. Oh, I know, yeah. Well, um, uh, who was the last who was in it? I think it was McGovern that was in that shed there, wasn't it? Was it Anthony? Yeah. Was it Anthony? Uh, Jane. Jane. Yeah. He was also teaching in the school, wasn't he? Was yeah. yeah. That's the old school at the back. Yeah. The school was just ahead. They built a new house there. I think some of the family or something, I think, or something. Yeah, of course, okay. Yeah. I think that was the reason. Yeah. Stop us into the new house then, didn't they? Yeah, they were able to put up into the new house. Yeah. And all the things they do. And they left one house for a month. Yeah. What year that happened then, though? No, I wasn't going to clue about that year. Yeah. In after, after, all the land, I missed the mother was forced to for a year. Remember, Mrs., when uh, they moved into the... New post office for you. I do. Which was the date of it? Nin before 1930, was it? Yeah, oh, I thought it was before. What is it? No, it's not one before. <coughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, close enough. I'm moving up now to the site of. Carmel Pamuk of 1836. Anthony McGordon taught here. He came all the way out from Carnick Sean until he built his own house down here where the old post office was. He must have taught here for about 50 years or more and after him came his son, James. James was teaching there I know in 1914, maybe in the 1880s too. They must have had very little holidays. I can see entries in registers for the old school dated 4th, 6th and 18th of August. They must have been working through most of the month of August. It must have been all work for no play. There were pupils here from Fohul, Banher, Belter, not Bohol. 
Now in 1836, the public school was here for 60 pupils, endowed with a £29 a year grant by Mrs. Palmer. And she lived down in the bushes there in Caramore House. Anthony McGordon taught here according to Canon Michael of Pilala, with distinction to his name, his claims is still a legend in Lacken. His sons were John, James, Tom and his daughters were Kate and Bridget. All became teachers as well. Among those who passed through his hands were three who later became priests. Tom O'Hara, William McGordon, Pat Keevney. His son James later taught here. And uh, he also owned the post office, the old post office down there. Now there were also pupils here from Clunanas, Palmerstown, Turin. Uh, the Neelands were stewards in Caramore at the time and they sent their family up here in 1896 and there were also Neelands shopkeepers around Caramore because they had children going to this particular school and there we see the boundary going up there to the left. On the left of that boundary is Banner Lake and down by the stream here is Caramore, right of it is Banner Lake. Left of that house. Caramore. There is the site of the old post office and the residence of the McGurns before they moved in the 1920s across the road here. Now we're pat across here from the post office over to um, Bally Murphy and on towards Bally Castle because people did most of the travelling on foot in those days. Now there's a stream that goes down there uh, towards Thomas Town, uh, towards Clunalhan River, towards the bridge and that is the boundary. It goes between the post office and the Bobby Door. Alan Malek, the town of the flags, or the town of the fold of the flags. <laughs> there we see 218 acres almost of it, as it was in 1838. Now, here would be the path from the post office across to Barramorphy. And there would be the path from McDonald's of Bandelec meeting that one. And there's the site of old McDonald's house, and the site of uh, a herd's house that was there across from it, and the site of Mickey Scanlon's board's Ford, or Smithy, Peter Scanlon he was called later, and there was the site of the uh, Hertz house built by um, Samuel Crozier McCormick for um, Paddy Healy's father. Paddy Healy was his name. When he managed to evict him from the old Hertz house that was built just across from McDonald's. And this stream here, right of this stream is Banner Lake. It comes down to the Karakanas Road here, crosses the river, and that little piece of land left of the river there, and this uh, shown here, on the right of the road is Barren Elect. The site of the quarry is up along this river some now. This is where. Uh, by its old houses and by this hedge here is a stream, the townland boundary. Stream. Running down to Cornalhan River. Ban the light. <laughs> and this is uh, where the site of the old smithy was. Right, by the stream here on the right here, left of that is Ballinan Lake, right of it is Caramore. Caramore land the other side of that fence, Ballinan Lake here. All up here, this is the road. From here on up is Ballinan Lake. And on the left here was the site of the smithy, Peter Scanlon. He was known, I think, as Mickey Scanlon's forge, or he was known as Mickey Scanlon. Scanlons are here today, just fair knots. In there somewhere was the site of his, uh, the site of his forge. 
he's down on the valuation of 1856 to give it valuation as Peter's can, but I think the local people called him Mickey. Yes. Now in here on the left is the Scanlon household. Peter Scanlon lived there. This is, I think, the only road going through the town under Barnley Lake. Here on the right, as we see it, is Caramore School, situated in the townland of Barnley Lake. <coughs> this piece of land was given to them by the McCormick's, the Niall McCormick, to build this school here. There was a tradition there, the Palmers and McCormick's giving them land for school building and their sites. Barnley Lake. According to O'Donovan, comes from Bailon Alicke, town of the flag. It would be Bailon Alicke, the town of the flags. In 1838, it contained 217 acres. It was owned by Roger Patimer of Caramore House. Tenants hired at the rent of 1.5 and 9 pence an acre. They grew the usual crops of oats, flax and potatoes. There were 24 Catholic families here. In 1856, the immediate lesser was Captain Fibbs. Uh, also, uh, a Michael who had four uh, acres and leased it to Timothy Kilgray as a tenant. Other tenants were John McAvey, who had 122 acres rented, Reverend Peter Neely, who had 28 acres rented, and had a herd's house. They that herd's house is probably that one that's there. It isn't the one, but uh, one was built later, I'd say. That area. Peter Scanlon, 19 acres. Michael Ford, 42 acres. Timothy Kilgray, 4 acres. Michael Ford, one cottage without land. Now, Martin Darcy owned this town land <coughs> in 1641 according to Simington's book of survey and distribution. <coughs> well, this house down here is Scanlon's. Down below that, <coughs> around 1872. <coughs> Maybe long before that, there was a forge there that belonged to a man named Scanlon. He had a child going to a Caramore Primer School farther down near the post office. A Peter Scanlon was a tenant here in 1856, so he probably was the smithy that owned the forge down there, just below that house there. This is Caramore School. In Ballinalake. This here is Caramore School, built in the year 1933, and up there is a shelter, which was not there in my time, 1945 to 1952, and uh, I see some nice murals painted on the walls there. And up there is the house Samuel Crozier McCormick built for Paddy Healy. Down there is the yard, the schoolyard. Here is the main entrance. It wasn't the main entrance in my time. It was down around the corner there. This school was built in 1933. And uh, the first teacher in here, I think, was Paddy Glacken. And after him came Sean Burke, who is now dead a few years, he came from Heathfield, and a few pupils gained a few county council scholarships and made a civil service, but in 1922, uh, 1952 got really going when Jerry McNulty and myself won two Gaelic scholarships to uh, prepare the college in Galway, and from then on we were able to qualify, and many more followed. Then after him came Finan Burke, and now Paddy Laden is in here. Now this school here was built uh, after the other one. 
and the Pam have contributed the site also. The other one was down in that direction near the post office. The Pamers and McCormick's have been very helpful in providing sites and schools for this area. This is a health house. In 1856, Peter Mary had one rented here from Captain Fibbs. It was probably situated down there. Later on, there was a paddy healer here. And Samuel Crozier McCormick used his legal knowledge to take away his squatter's rights. He built him a new house, and then he had him put out of it when he couldn't pay the rent. Whereas he couldn't have put him out of the old one. He had squatter's rights. Your father was a carpenter here, up until when? 1933. Uh, yeah. And that's where the old uh, hub house was down there, for the kid there. Yeah. And this was the one that he was able to uh, evict. The one he moved him into. Yeah, and the one he moved him out of too, wasn't it? And the one he moved him out of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, your father, who did he do the carpenter work for? Was it for the McCormick's or...? Uh, no, he didn't. I think he got to do it for the McCormick's. Oh, a general man around the place. He worked for McCormick's, he worked. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. And you're about to move over here now, aren't you? Yes, in the near future. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? No. This is the road that goes through Baron and Lake. <coughs> Left and right of this road. Goes way up past that bend there. Now you can see the boundary fence on the left going away down. The other side of that fence, the far side, is Baron Hill Lower. This fence goes away down to meet the river that comes down by Carrickness Road. And down somewhere there is the site. This is the other side now of the road. Now up here is the townland boundary fence. On the right of that is Bandelect. On the left side there is Barn Hill Upper. <coughs> and up there is Achi Clough, or the site of the Stone House, as mentioned by O'Donovan in 1838. Now this is January of 84. It looks cold and it is cold. We are on Bam Hill upper here. The far side of the ditch there of the fence is Baron Elect. Looking out there at it on the right. On the left here is Ban Hill Upper. And that ditch there right of it is Balna Lake. That ditch is the townland boundary of Balna Lake. And on the right hand side is uh, yeah, Balna Lake. This area in here is called Achi Clough. Rauchi Clough, the site of the stone house, and there we see it, stones sticking up out of the ground. Maybe it is the ruins of an old house, or uh, maybe it is the ruins of a pre-Christian burial. This area around here uh, would be called Archie Clough in 1838. There's another look at it. Donalds of Bandalek, and by this house went a pathway that met the other pathway coming from the post office, both going towards Ballymurphy. Now I'm told people going to the ball took this direction. Now across here is the site of uh, the first head house, our uh, head's house that was here by Reverend Peter Neary, and there's the site of the second one built by Samuel Crozier. <coughs> now Paddy, old Paddy Healy was in this old site across the road here, 
as a herd and he hates waters right and uh, McCormick wanted to get him out I think we told the story before and so he built him a new one and then he was able to evict him now this is the road one and only down to Banalet and it ends just here at this bend right here we're looking down to the town end of Caramore where we were before and where I omitted some information about this school here there we see the site or extent of the playground that was uh, that Caramore Palmer School had and I'm told that it was there in 1820 another look at the site of the Palmer Schoolhouse Now this is the daily report book or a page from the daily report book of the school that was situated uh, in this area that we have been talking about. And there we see the name Caramore Primer National School, the road number 6942, parish of Lacken County Mayo and the electoral area Lacken South. In the barony of Tirari, the nearest post office town was Caramore. Yeah, well it had been with Lacken too, I think, as I mentioned there, and the area, five and three quarters spare uh, purchase, built in the year 1877. And uh, a shilling a year was paid as rent to R.C. Palmer of Caramore and by the manager. And there we see that the uh, precise date of opening as a school, 1820. So it was there before 1877 as a national school. And we see uh, internal dimensions of each room, 40 feet, and the internal breadth, 16 feet, and the uh, external dimensions of the house, 44 feet, and the external breadth, 20 feet, and the height of the walls up to the eave, 12 feet, and they uh, had uh, some furniture there too. Number of desks and firms, seven. Eight foot long. And separate firms, six of them. No committee. And no meetings held. And uh, Reverend Hugh Conway, living in the parish priest, living down at the Strand, was the manager. The teacher had no residence. Yeah. Some data on the Caramore Palmer School. One of the pages from the daily report book for the year 1889. Caramore Palmer School. Earlier I stated that Caramore Palmer School was here in 1836. In fact, the page that we've just seen there from the Daily Report Book of January 1889 indicates there was a school here in 1820. It was used as a national school. It was built from private homes. The Palmer's more than likely built it. The area was five and three quarters square pounds. And that would include the extent, the extent of the school there. The school itself is 44 feet long by 22 feet wide and 12 feet high as far as the age. The inside dimensions were 40 feet long by 16 feet wide. The furniture of the day, 7 farms, 8 feet long and 6 farms. I don't know how many feet long they were. There was no school committee and no meetings held. The manager, Hugh Conway, the parish priest of Red Lion, he was the manager. He paid a shilling a year to Mr. R.C. Palmer as rent. Anthony McGonagall, I think, was the first teacher here. And that would change his son. Barn Hill, Lower. Coming from uh, Barna, or a gap, in the hilltop. And there we see it, 144 
acres of it. Now there's the road that goes up to Barn Hill Lake and separates Barn Hill Lower from Barn Hill Upper. It's 200 feet over sea level. And there's a river or a stream that runs down through it. And uh, there are stepping stones used by people that use the footpath way over from Barry Murphy over to the post office in Paramore. And there's the site of a port or an ancient settlement. And there's another look at the shape of Barn Hill. And the boundary is down there between Bernalek and Bern Hill. Bern Hill Lower on the left hand side of the road here. This house here is Dennis Langens. He was a stonemason and built many houses. He built uh, uh, my father's house and this was drawn around 1938. On the right hand side of the road, Ban Hill Upper. On the left, Ban Hill Lower. And this is a uh, house here, is one of the many McGee's houses in this town band. This is a McGee house also. Baron Hill is also named from the little top, Barneen, or a gap in the mountains, Barna. That mountain top or Barnum would be in Barn Hill Upper at the peak of the mountains, I suppose. It would hardly be situated in Barn Hill Lower. And there's a road going up to Barn Hill Upper. Barn Hill Lower. The contour done when it came from there is for Bardneen. It means little top or Barneen or little gap. To be a gap on a hilltop or a gap on a mountain top. It has 144 acres of land. It was in 1838 the property of Sir William Palmer. His agent was John Heaviside of 13 Hollow Street, Dublin. And P. Nolan of Mine Killala was the other agent. Now, Baron Hill Lower is way down here. That side of this road here. Tenants in 1838 paid 30 shillings an acre annually. 30 families lived here in 1838. They were all very poor. The crops were roast barley and potatoes. In 1856, according to the Griffith valuations, the terms were Patrick Mahan, Patrick Kennedy, Mary Ford, Mary Ford, Bridget Carroll, Hugh Neary, Bridget McGee, James Jordan, Mary O'Hara, Thomas Kinhart, and John McAndrew. Uh, much the same as the townland of Barrow. Well, now, 30 families lived here in 1838. Only, lovely, on, only 11 families were left after the famine in 1856. It was much the same as the townland of Barrow that had only 25 families in 1838 and only 5 after the famine in 1858. And today, in 1983, there's only 2. Barton Hill has 2 or 3 families here today. Townland boundary going way down there. Barton Hill. Lower. Over there on the right, Barry Murphy. There's the town and boundary, that fence going down there, all the way to the river. And there are stepping stones down there in the fort. There's a river here. It's somehow probably up there.
and the stepping stones. Now the path went down by the river here, on the left hand side. And there is a fort, an ancient settlement. The bushes up there in the distance is where the road is situated. Settlements like this were from 15, uh, up to 1500 uh, AD. Now down by the river there on the left hand side, the path went. The path from Ballymurphy uh, into Caramora and in through that depression there through the fort, right through it, and down for Caramora. Now there, that black line going down there is the river. It's the town land boundary. Baden Hill, Lower, in there. And that's Bally Murphy, the one and only house in it, McAndrews. People did a lot of walking in those days, and this was the shortest cut through the fields. Hence the path from Bally Murphy to the post office. <laughs> Baron Hill Upper, named from the little top or the little gap in the hilltop, 400 feet over sea level, and that's what it looks like, 373 acres. That's the road between, on the right, upper, Baden Hill Upper, and on the left, Baden Hill Lower. Now the road doesn't go out that far, it goes there, and that area is called Sweep, from there in. And there's an old road up to the old village of Baden Hill, and uh, there's the site of an ancient fort, or settlement, and there was another road running up there too. That one is in fairly good repair. There are many little roads in the townland. There's the situation of the old village. Of course there would be a lot of houses, 37 of them scattered all around there. There wouldn't be big houses, there would be small. There's the size of a, site of a trigonometrical point, and here's a contour line 400 feet over sea level. Now in that area there is the site of an old fort or an ancient burial ground. It may have been pre-Christian. And this is the road that separates uh, the upper townland of Baden Hill from the lower townland of Baden Hill. Passing by Dennis Langans on the left. He had been on this road before doing Baden Hill Lower. Geese, I think. Now there were 35 houses up here on the right in 1850. Well, in 1838, only 21 in 1856. 14 of them had disappeared during the famine years. And there's another new house built by one of Dennis Langan's sons one of the few new houses that have been built in this townland. Very few of the old names of 1856 survive here. And there's one of the old roads leading up to the old village. Very much disused today.
and here's another one of them that led up there or led up to uh, the old village of course there are many little roads up at 400 at uh, the level of 400 feet over sea level a lot of little roads moving through some of them leading on to Bella Castle and more of them out to Lissadrone and of course this town ran on the way out to Lissadrone Bog and back towards the Calumet Sound and Cacullan and there's the side of another roadway to the right there and here we are coming on to now to the area which is known as Sweep Now, uh, Baden Hill goes beyond this road there for a little distance and over here. That's looking at it from west to east. The townland of Baden Hill, upper. And up here in this area, way up in the fields there, is this site of a, either a fort or a burial ground which has not been registered. But named after the little top or little gap, Baden Hill. Now, that could be it over there, or over here, I'd say it's over there. It is 400 feet over sea level. It has 373 acres. In 1838 it had. It belonged to Sir Bedlow Palmer. His agent was P. Nolan of mine. Uh, it had 120 acres of uncultivated land. The remainder supported 35 families. They were all Roman Catholics and they paid £70 annually in rent. In 1856, according to the Griffith valuations, there were 21 families here. 14 families had disappeared during the famine years. Sir W. Roger Palmer, the baronet, owned it. The tenants were Anthony Cairn, he had ten and a half acres rented. Anthony Cairn, seven acres. Thomas Kelly, sixteen and a half. Thomas Kelly, thirty acres. Thomas Kelly, eighteen acres. Anthony Cairn, sixteen and a half acres. Another Thomas Kelly, eleven and a half acres. Patrick Mahon, eight acres. Hugh Neary, he may have been a brother of Father Peter, Reverend Peter Neary. He had a land and a health house. He had thirteen acres. Michael Kilcullen, 20 and a half acres. Hugh Neary again, same man, he must have a second hold on here, 23 and a half acres. Michael Kilcullen, land and health house, 62 acres. And Michael Kilcullen, 10 and a half acres. Other tenants were John Scott, Michael Doherty, Connor, Connor Kearney, Michael Ford, Patrick Kennedy, Mary Ford. They paid a total of £167.11 11 shillings in rent annually. Now, some of these people, uh, they have owned two or three holdings or had them rented. Some of the names survived. Paddy Kennedy's has gone and uh, Kearney's have gone and Ford's I think have gone. So this was it here, above the road, on this area up here. This was known as Baden Hill Upper. Now the other side of this road here, down there, was Baden, Baden Hill Lower. Now this here is a mound of earth which once, I suppose, could have been the uh, passage grave. Yes, it, it certainly looks very like it, well, passage graves would date from about 2500 BC, uh, down to maybe four or five hundred years, maybe more. Um, they had a kind of a curve, a ring round them. That now would be the, the, the centre of it, where the burials took place, and there were usually cremations. Yes. Now that's, uh, that's still the centre. I <coughs> see in the, uh, in the distance now at the far edge, uh, that would be some of the curve stones. Or that possibly is a capstone that rolled down um, when the mound was... Uh, a round head in those uh, days. Yeah. yeah, a round head yeah. Denuded by farmers or other people looking for... Yes, and weathering I suppose too would have yeah. uh, washed some of it away. <coughs> now, uh, this uh, there's part of the curve again now. No. And some of those stones are moved off the position. They should be in a kind of a circle or in an oval. Yeah, the entrance was from here, I'd say, going in from this side, yes. east to west in the, the centre. Yeah, well, that's, that's generally the way they... Yeah. And this one was not marked now by O'Donovan. I don't think, or on the present day maps, it's not marked this particular uh, passage. Well, I'd say that that's well worth investigating because um, I'm sure there would be some kind, possibly pottery, uh, bone pins or yeah. maybe human remains. Yeah. Now that's the boundary going over towards uh, Carrick Sean and Lissadrone. It's all a boggy area here. No, uh, but um, 
the fact that there's a very mound there would mean that it was inhabited for at least a thousand yeah. years and maybe two. Yeah. Some of the first, and these are some of the ancient roads that were here in about 1838. There was a big population here before the famine, yes. living in these bad conditions. And before the climate changed, and you know, when, when that was uh, pastoral and arable, as they called it, it would have supported a bigger population still. Yeah. I suppose so. Uh, yes, and that mound, that very ill place, is it uh, a kind of proof positive, if you like, that there were a large number of people in the area. Oh, yeah. Maybe not on the hill, but yeah. certainly in the district. Yeah. Well, these are the roads used by the tenants and the uh, small farmers in those days, 1838, before the famine, and possibly after the famine. And they had very poor land for living in. This is not Baha now. Also about 400 feet over sea level. Two houses in it. And now we're looking down, we can see the Cast Lackens gazebo there, and Lacken Strand. Great view from up here. Yeah. Also here is a, a trigonometrical point where Ordnance Survey took levels and checked out their findings right here now, where we're standing. Covered in bushes there. Yeah. Now he would be standing there on the mound, the highest point of Van Hill, probably the place that gives its name, or uh, yes, gives the name Barnin. The little top or the little gap, probably the little top to Baden Hill. There's the present day houses of the village. A lot of them uninhabited. And there's the Palmerstown River running out there by Khartoum and Kilada Bay in the background. And if we can see the Sahi up there. Yeah. And one of the many roads in it, still being used I think, this one. So this one has been used fairly recently, there are tracks of... Well, cover up now in Michael Herity's um, passage graves dating from about 2000 BC. And that's of Cairn U, as it is today, at Loch Crew. And you can see the burial chambers there and the passage leading uh, on this side. <coughs> now, what he calls cruciform tombs. And they are, they are very much the same now as the ones, uh, the ones we were looking at. Um, all of these are different variations uh, and then in later times uh, they kind of went away um, uh, into, this, into this shape. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, uh, this is a photograph now of the mound uh, at Dog uh, <coughs> and of course the one we're talking about now on Barden Hill wouldn't be anything like the size of that one but it would be the same general yeah. shape and there would be this mound of earth and stones and so on piled up over the burial plot or and over the burial spaces and the entrance would be over here on the right hand side wouldn't it if we were looking yeah, at there that's right that's and these right. were denuded by farmers or other people that needed the stones uh, yes later on you know the, um, the rain and the frost and everything else <coughs> over the years because in 2000 years there would be a fair, a fair amount of erosion and then there was a change in climate too in the meantime. Well, it'll never leave it in the position that that uh, barrier of ground we're looking at there would be in. Like these stones, oh, no, they no. were all hooked <coughs> up and the whole mound round the edge was well, uprooted, well, wasn't well, it? Part of, part of it, no, part of it is in position, all right, but some of the stones are displaced, all yeah, right, you can yeah, see that. Yeah. Uh, but they were too big to roll very far. Yeah. Well, the, the, the useful stones, I suppose, were taken away for drainage or roads or whatever. There are a lot of little roads up here. Yeah, that's it, or, or field fences. Or yeah, yeah, or the like. Coming back again out of this photograph of, of, uh, of Loch Crow, uh, these chamber, the burials uh, were in here in these chambers. And now in this one you can see there are divisions. And they would be cremated, <coughs> and the bones then would be deposited here. Yeah. And over a thousand years, or maybe two thousand years, these places were still used for burials. And <coughs> there would be what they 
uh, call in dictionary terms ordinary inhumations afterwards yeah. down to, Christ to Christian times I yeah. would think. The reason we are doing this is Baden Hill looks something like this yeah. Yeah. and this kind of thing could have gone on there over 2000 uh, years BC Yes, yeah. uh, and possibly for the thousand afterwards too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yes, for a long period, there, but like mm -hmm. uh, it was mm -hmm. populated, I'd say, about that time and maybe earlier. Mm. But the similarity is remarkable. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so much so that you you could nearly say positively that it's it's one of these or, or um, <coughs> more than likely one of those anyway. Yeah, a passage grave. Passage, yes. A, yes, a cabin too. Allahan, named after the meadow of Allahan. It has 236 acres of land. <coughs> and there we see it, bounded on most sides by streams. There's the Clunalahan River running down towards Lachan Strand on the west side. And on the east side, another stream goes down and into the Clunalahan River. And uh, this area up here is another river there too. And there's the road that goes down through the centre of the town land from Antol's Bohol. And this is the road that goes up through uh, Clunbo Yes. And there's the village at the centre of it. The village of Clunalahan in the townland of Clunalahan. Now this road goes away up and out through Clunboy. Here's the site of an old house at the bridge. And there's the bridge, the boundary bridge, Clunalahan Bridge, named after the townland and the river. Flows away down. Right of that river is the townland of Clunalahan. Now Clunalahan also extends this side of the road. <coughs> Goes away up by this river here. Left of the river. And it goes away around. Here you see the river coming up here. I also have the river is barren like <coughs> And it goes away around the hill there at the back until it meets at the stream at the back of uh, McLean's and McLean's house uh, away over there in these bushes Now there's the other road, going to the centre of the townland. Now this road leads to Clunboy. When it leaves the townland, a couple of hundred yards up the road here. That's a Kearney house, a uh, house that had a shop one time, and the last shop they had, I believe, was uh, butchering or selling meat. Tony Mihal. 
Hatch Hanley or something was the name of the house of the old man that lived here. That's the original house. Now there's the stream, that's the boundary. Left of that is Clunallahan. <coughs> Over there is another town land. And across here. Now up here, on the road here, is in uh, Clunallahan. There's a stream that crosses the road here. That is the boundary. Not the drain there, but a stream, the other left side of the road, as we see it. <coughs> and there it comes down by um, McLean's. And the way up around the corner there until it meets somewhere near the Clunarhan River, the far side of the hill. You can see the drain going way up there. Now the house on the left there is in Clun Boy. Uh, the stream runs right under the pillars there and down along the road, under the car. You see it running down there. And that house there is McLean, it's in Clun Boy. The dog is probably in it. Between us and the dog there is the townland boundary. Now this road here is in Clunallahan. The meadow of Allahan. Now down there to the left was the site of an old house. I don't know was it of some importance or not. Now we're heading off towards the heartland of Clunallahan. To the village of Clunallahan in the townland of Clunallahan. And here we see it right ahead here. Now left here, on the left hand side, is the fort, which is not on the maps, on the today's maps. Allahan's fort, a, a big one, the one that gives its name to the townland. The chief himself is supposed to be buried there, Allahan. We we'll go up here to the left to find it. This is the village of Clunallahan and the townland of Clunallahan. According to the Donovan of 1838, it comes from Clunallahan, Allahan's meadow or law. It is in the parish of Black and it was the property of Deborah Kirkwood of Clunallahan. He let it to occupying tenants for uh, two lives and to others at will. Rent was 29 shillings an acre annual. Oats, flax and potatoes were the crops. The village of Clunallahan was situated in the middle of the townland. Here is the village and down that way. It contained almost 236 acres of land. In 1856 it was leased uh, to Captain Phibbs, and he had at least two tenants, and the tenants were Patrick Taha, Patrick Franklin, James Mahan, Patrick Taha, Charles Kearney, Aeneas Early, Patrick Kearney, Patrick Kearney, Owen Kearney, Owen Kearney, Patrick Kearney, McGurn, Ellen Rogan, Patrick James, who had 45 acres in it, and he had a head's house, Thomas Kearney, John Rape, and Patrick Taha again. Many of names are occurring over and over again. It may have been the same man that had a few uh, holdings rented from Captain Fred's or least. Now this townland gets its name from... Now, Alhans Fort is uh, not in the direction I pointed out there. It is across the road in uh, Patrick Kearney's field, just behind the house. On the right here is uh, James E. Clarks. He has been dead for the last, oh, many years, 40 years. He was a weaver, a linen weaver and uh, uh, a woolen weaver. Now we are approaching the stream here passing down is the boundary. It goes way up there to the right. And down to the left, crosses the way down there and goes away over to the left. Left of that stream, Clunallahan. It goes into the Clunallahan River and is the townland boundary on the north side.
Reuters Fohol. And here are the lands of Clunalahan. Now, way up there to the right on this side is another fort. This one is marked in on the 6 inch map of the day. Uh, it may have been a burial ground, but it doesn't give its name to the townland. And now, up here is the house of James E. Clark. This house was built by Aeneas Early, who was a builder. And here is the fort, here at the back of the present day Patrick Kearney's field, a massive fort, Allahan's fort. Tradition has it that he is buried here. The structure has fallen apart over the years. You can see how it has been built, or it had been built up there. Almost six feet in height, maybe six feet in height. of stones and clay and this is what it looks like on the top there forward is Patrick Hearney's house and we see the extent of Alhans Fort which I don't know if I omitted for some unknown reason now here I'd say is the tunnel where it would start the escape chamber somewhere around here where he's standing and it goes off uh, in that direction out there we say that because many liquids and fertilizers on the ground there have disappeared down through here for some unknown reason. Allahan's Fort. Now here in Paul Ailey's land is a site of an ancient school that was here possibly before or during the same time as the Caramore Palmer School. Who did you hear saying that uh, it was there? Tomataha. Yeah, well, that's part of the heath, is it? Yeah. There was four or five houses in there. Must have been more than that, then, wasn't it? No, well, it was them that was working on the rundales down there, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I run rundales here, too. This area here? Yeah. Probably was. But that leveled it out. They did, yeah. <laughs> and the last bit was leveled the other day, wasn't it? Why? Yeah. There they are. There they are. Yeah. The was all leveled at that time. <laughs> if you were ahead. That was the day so I was in business, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, the site of the old school. You don't know they ever hear the name of the schoolmaster that was here? No. He wasn't Hoban, was he? No. Or Mehdi? No? No, we never have the name. Yeah. Old people there. That's the early man who built in the house there above. Yeah. That he built that pair of tantrums. Yeah. What's the market now? Here, here. And he hadn't the money to put the slates on it. And he wouldn't get the they wouldn't buy them then. Well, they wouldn't rent it like they them. wouldn't rent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, right down there are the run deal. Yeah, below at the track now. There's no one below at anything in the town. Yeah. Well, one man that owned it, was it? Yeah. Like he owned each strip, was it? Yeah. And he... Well, could he till it? He could till it, but uh, he couldn't graze it, right? No, he'd have to tether the cow mm. there, wouldn't he? He'd be there with him. He'd have to tie the cow to his leg and be working away. Oh, was that it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting me now, one? <laughs> I believe it... I believe, no, no, I believe it was a constant source of... Uh, what was it then? Uh, Aggravation down here, these run days, wasn't they? They yeah, were always, they they were always in the next... The and oh. then if you let out a cow, she was gone into the next man. Yeah. yeah. And the wall was up then? Oh, the wall was up. Did you ever hear of any fist fights being here on account no. of it? No. I uh, just uh, having a go at one another, yapping away. Well, the house is much the same. Oh, they'll be different. 
No, it wasn't they built very close to one another. So what built up to other right there? So they must have houses must be going down far or down the down the lane there, were they? No. No. But don't have this man in here now. Yeah, and round the boat. Hello. Yeah. What's going down here? Yeah. Yeah. In, so it's down this way. And over along the ditch. And over where the white track is. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me. Were there houses going down any further than this? Yeah, yeah. You never hear about any fights about the, the run, Dave? Did you not? Do you remember the run, Dave, being in use? You did not, did you? Who owned the land at that time? Oh, yeah. Where was that little road going over there now? See that little road going over there? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, it's just one side that way. On the right hand side? Yes. That's, that's that was where St. Patrick was supposed to have landed for, was it? It's actually what you said he came under man when I go to Salmon. Ah, yes. Do you know, do you know the... They never thought of Salmon, because I was in England, because the tide never come up. Yeah. Do you remember the end? I think that he actually, he said he was the next one. Yeah, and everyone was bigger. The next one was bigger. He said that never would be Salmon. Well, did he throw the stone in the water and say that the Salmon wouldn't be caught for again until it was washed ashore? He did. It is. There was never a salmon. Yeah. So I think he was wrong. I think the big south was seven or eight pounds. Did you? He was a salmon. You think he was a salmon? <laughs> Maybe down stone was washed ashore again, was it? Yeah, I know. That would be washed Yeah. But what did he do now? I wouldn't have been a salmon. Tell me, what side was he standing on? Must be the fourth side. The fourth side, because the hill in is there all the time. Oh, yeah. You see, that must be only now, remember that. Well, it might be bigger than what it is today, Thomas. <laughs> it, it, it could be. It could be. The water is swollen in and it's getting out. Yeah. Oh, that's in the They never grew a shell out here. Never did? No. That's where all the four trees used to be saved one of the things. Yeah. You yeah. just have to worry about all that. Oh, I see you there. I got it there. Oh, that's a tower. Would you get it there? Oh, yeah. Huh? What do you think it was? The lithium, was it? Yeah. The lithium. Yeah. 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 How long ago since the last burial, Tommy? Uh, what is it? Is this almost 50? Oh, well over 50, is it? Yes. Yeah. Since the last burial was in it. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any special name on it there? <laughs> the Lysine in Karamoa <coughs> and they are the Rundales that have been motivated lately. You can see the dark tracks of the clay. In between them was the Rundale of the Cree Lodge and one man dared not trespass on the other. Belong to the people of the Balahis. They were the constant source of aggravation and trouble between the tenants and the uh, uh, cottagers or whatever they were that were living here. Now, down here we are told, in this area, just about here now, is the site of a giant's grave. Tradition has it. Tommy Tahar is the source. In that area. He said there were a few stones left there. Well, this I'm down standing here, the giant's grave. Now, this is the house of John Clark, the weaver.
How was some of James's wisdom? 40 years ago, was it? Yeah. Oh, long one of the old. Mr. Well, 40 years ago. No. That's Feather's way. The last that was ever driven alone. Yeah. Well, your father's name wasn't James, was it? John. John. Oh, yeah. Handy work. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, what else did he do? Had he the cattle machine? No. He hadn't. Well, they had cattle of some type or another, hadn't they? They had the they had cars, oh, cars and the spinning machine. Right, the wheels, yeah. The spinning wheels, that's right. Yeah. And then they had the warping bars, which they had to warp the threads, you see, yeah. or just put in the load. Yeah. And then they turned out some material like this, didn't they? That's right. Yeah. You never heard of Williams's tailors in this townland, no? No, no. Coleman's are right like that. Coleman. Yeah. We were there were two Coleman. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear of Hoban uh, down in Fohol, no? Yeah, in Hoban, yeah. 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 In the in the in the townland there was the, the weavers and there was the carpenters and there was the builders and there was and the, the shoemakers. Shoemakers Franklin's up there. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. the teachers now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's lately they were living here, wasn't it? Quite, yeah. The people here, they drove out of the scandals about what's next. They were? John Scandal, down about the back. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Peter, that's the name. Is, that yeah, the name is down there in 1856. You know, it's Peter. Now, I had some of them calling him Mickey. But Peter was the name I saw down on the evaluation of 1856. You are not looking for the bag now. We tried to have him in yeah, the yeah. bag. Just from here to there, so they put it. Yeah. First touch, take the post, look up. Now this, uh, John Clark here was one of the craftsmen of the village. Another one was the builder up here, Aeneas Early, and uh, Franklin's on the right here, shoemakers. The Earleys were also carpenters. Now tradition has it here that this bush ahead was called Piper's Bush. For some unknown reason they had music there late at night. And uh, Maybe phosphorus if they had travelled the marsh on their shoes, which gave the idea of fire now and again. A tradition. That wall by the gate going down there, the bush in the background, is supposed to be called Clay Chordna or Clay Torna. There was supposed to be a lightning strike there. Another man said it was the boundary. Well, there's no boundary there at present. Each of these villages were uh, kind of a complete unit. They had the craftsman, they had the weaver, and then here was the shoemaker, uh, a Paddy Franklin, or a Patrick. And uh, further up to the right there was the uh, builder in his early. He lived up here. He was also a carpenter. This was the house he built. And there's this plaque on the wall, erected by Aeneas Early in the year 1874. He intended to have a schoolhouse here. In here to the left, Franklin the shoemaker lived. Townland of Clonarahan. So we're looking there at the Rundale system. <coughs> yes, indeed. Um, I understand that um, the Latin area was one of the last places where it was um, in operation. Uh, it is common all over the country. Um, 100, 150 years ago. And in fact, <coughs> I think it goes back to pre-Norman times. Yeah. Um, only times now what used to happen is um, <coughs> they had pieces of land and they had a rotation. Now, I'm not absolutely certain of the rotation, but I think it was potatoes, oats, um, maybe uh, oats yeah. again. <coughs> then it was left fallow for a year or two years. <coughs> and then they went to another field. Now, taking each field individually, the whole village then uh, had stripes there. And the little sound uh, divisions between them were called quilod. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the divisions themselves, there probably is an Irish name for them, but I don't know it. Um, <coughs> they, had, they were arranged in such a way that, um, if you like, <coughs> the light soil and the good soil and maybe the wet uh, 
were part of every uh, part of everybody's patch. Mm. The the field was divided um, as evenly as they could. <coughs> then they drew lots for it, and somebody who had a particular patch one year needn't necessarily have it the next day. The the headman in the village used to draw lots, uh, <coughs> and that was the fairest way. The same way too with the quality of the soil. Yeah. <coughs> they tried to arrange the patches in such a way that it was evenly divided. Yeah. So the, the constants, the, they were a constant source of aggravation and uh, rows and... Uh well, uh, the, there again, uh, you see, uh, they had common edges. <coughs> now, the difficulty was the fences. Um, the, what was uh, <coughs> set aside for tillage wasn't supposed to be grazed. Yeah. <coughs> but then there were headlands, and uh, sometimes that was a little bit too good to let go. Yeah. <coughs> but it meant, in other words, uh, that any man who grazed uh, a tillage place wasn't playing the game <coughs> and for that reason he'd, uh, he'd probably get the enmity of his neighbours. <coughs> now they had a way of, <coughs> excuse me, they had a way of dividing the the community as well. <coughs> I can't remember exactly now what it was, this is going back now to the Breton laws. <coughs> the grazing for two geats I think was equal to that of a sheep. <laughs> <coughs> the grazing of two sheep I think was the same as a, uh, as a calf. <coughs> uh, two calves then <coughs> I think uh, same as a year old, and two year olds then um, <coughs> the same as a full grown animal. Yeah. <coughs> that that subject to correction, but uh, they had they had a division like that. Yeah, this was when land was unfenced and all the people of the village owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. had to go the Well, there was there, there, there were commonages up for, for a long time. <coughs> Lacken Hill was all a commonage at one stage. Yeah, there's still a commonage down there in Lacken the Reef, but it's <coughs> not been used. Uh -huh. you know? Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm. <coughs> um, there was a man <coughs> called Knight, uh, who was the engineer for the North Coast Road, <coughs> and he spent a good deal of his time previous to that uh, in Binghamstone area, <coughs> and he's written fairly extensively about um, this system. <coughs> There's another man called Eston Evans, um, and he came and did an investigation of the Lacken ones, and I think that was about 1927, <coughs> and that's the last uh, authoritative thing that I know about uh, concerning uh, the whole Rundale system. Yeah. Each village now had uh, they were a, a whole unit, and they had uh, all their craftsmen there. I think mm. you know something about the uh, the weavers, how it worked. Yeah. yeah well, no, there were linen and um, woolen weavers. Yeah. Mm. But for the linen weavers, uh, I don't think there was one to every village, but certainly there would have been one to every two or three town lands, <coughs> and then the more quite a number of the linen weavers. Uh, came in, or the families came in from the, down from the north around 1795 and brought their looms with them. Um, <coughs> ordinarily now for the woolen weavers, the women of the house <coughs> would um, get the wool. Um, it had to be washed and scoured <coughs> first. <coughs> from there on then it had to be carded. Uh, <coughs> then it had to be spun uh, into single thread. They do that though with the, the spinning wheel, wouldn't they? The, the, one, yes. the timber one we see today. Uh, yeah, well, the, um, there was a special woolen wheel, which was a bigger wheel now than, yeah. the, than the flax yeah. wheel. Yeah. But a lot of them used to use the flax wheel for spinning too. Yeah. <coughs> then there were single threads. That uh, they had also what they call a walking machine then, for doubling or even trebling. They were usually uh, double threads. Um, <coughs> then the generally what they used to do was make it into big balls, <coughs> which would be about two or three stone weight. Uh, they would be oh, maybe 18 inches to two feet in diameter. They were brought to the weaver then, <coughs> usually on the, uh, in a dog and cream, yeah. or sometimes just um, tied onto the saddle. Um, the weaver then, I think, had to take it um, uh, into a hanks and then set it up on the <coughs> on his uh, loom. Yeah. Um, and the weaving itself was a slow and fairly complicated process. And like every other craft, <coughs> some men were better at it than others. Uh, <coughs> then. As the old people say, with respect to you, <coughs> they had a particular, they used to um, collect urine, mm -hmm. and that oh, was yeah. part of the treatment for, for uh, felting or thickening the, uh, the wool. Yes, the Colomarmen had a name for that, marsh that I used to hear them talking about, but that is, collected in barrels. That's it. Right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And where the, the fields then, where they spread it out, that would be the bleaching fields, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. Well, yes, that, that would be mostly now for the flax, yeah. uh, the flax, yeah. 
and uh, there were tours at Tory. That's right. There's got the tour back near Belly Castle there. It's supposed to be named after that particular thing. Ah, yes. And there's a tour in down at Lacken too. Maybe. Yes. Maybe it was named after <coughs> that. And it's sad to think that even the cards uh, for the carding of the wool <coughs> nearly disappeared off the scene. Another thing about the cards, <coughs> way back in trouble times, in land agitation and things like yes. that, uh, <coughs> the um, punishment for a man who didn't conform uh, was to give him a rub of the cards, which was a savage thing yeah. uh, on his bare back. Oh yeah, kind of savage punishment. Mm -hmm. mm. His, his community in those days, they were, they were uh, self-sufficient, weren't they? Oh, more or less. Uh, well, they had to be. Um, <coughs> if they weren't, uh, they just had to do without. They had the, they had the, uh, the blacksmith, the shoemaker, mm. the weaver, mm. and uh, Cool. For the, yeah, and for the doctor they had these people with charms, hadn't they? Going away back there, whatever. Uh, yes, yes. What did they uh, call them? Some kind of doctors? Uh, there was, it wasn't quite doctors. Mm. Mm, setters anyway. Oh, right, setters, yeah. Um, and seven sons and the likes, weren't they? Yes, yeah. uh, and peop people then who had cures. And there were animal doctors as well, who were worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> there's there's a, a photograph now of a flax wheel. Um, and this thing, that was the pedal thing. There's a kind of a, uh, a spindle out here <coughs> with a little attachment. You can't see it on this one. And pressing that starts the wheel to spin. This then is the uh, spool that goes round. Uh, <coughs> and this is for holding the thread. You can raise it or lower it. That's a flex wheel. <coughs> now, there's a woolen wheel, <coughs> which was a much bigger one. Now, and um, as I said, Lots of people used to use the flex wheel uh, for spinning uh, yarn as well, for spinning the, the woolen threads. Um, over here now is the warp. Uh, this thing collected the hanks uh, <coughs> and it, uh, it made it into hanks. Now, there's a size and a weight um, for one, uh, every one of those <coughs> and I, I don't know. Did that spin now? Did any of them spin? Yes, this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they're spinning uh, fast now or slow? Slow, it, it would be fairly slow yeah. uh, t uh, to take up this. <coughs> but normally when they wanted uh, blankets made and so on, uh, <coughs> as far as I can remember now, they used to uh, uh, to wind the thread into large balls, uh, which would be nearly that size now. And as I say, there would be two to three stone weight. Yeah. Um, and they knew the number of pounds of thread um, <coughs> which it would take uh, to make an ordinary blanket. Yeah. Now, <coughs> the linen ones, I don't know, I don't know exactly how they used to do the thread. But um, <coughs> again, it was brought to the weaver, usually. Um, uh, and he did the, the weaving part of it. But I think that the, the linen one uh, was in hanks, like this. Uh, right. <coughs> well, to rotate that now, uh, there was an attachment on to the, um, from here uh, to the pedals. Uh, this was went up and down, uh, and uh, it caused this then to rotate. Yeah, would it, would it be on that? On the yes, on the centre there, yeah. on the axle part. Yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. So that was yes. the story of weaving. Part of it, part, part of it, of only a little bit of it. Yeah. Sadly, now we haven't uh, we haven't a photograph there with the, the cards. Yeah. The only thing that's missing, I think, are a few, isn't it? Mm, yes, but they, they, now with linen, there's an awful lot more. Um, <coughs> Besides that, um, no. Before it reached this, before it reached this stage, um, it had to be pulled. <coughs> usually in July, they knew when the flowers were blue. Yeah. Um, <coughs> then uh, it was buried in a, uh, a bog hole <coughs> uh, until it rotted, until the outside uh, film rotted. <coughs> then they knew the length of time to leave it there. It was taken up then uh, to be partially drained. After that, then um, it had to be beaten to break this outer sheath to get at the strands of linen um, <coughs> and then oh, I can't remember now <coughs> that was Beatley those flex ponds there wasn't the ponds for wetting too wasn't it? Uh, that's it, <coughs> that's it. Um, then the uh, the Beatley kind of broke the outer the outer sheath uh, and separated the fibres then it had to be clothed and hackled I'm not sure which came first, no, the hackney yeah, or the gloves, yeah. but I think gloves and hackles. Um, <coughs> and then, uh, <coughs> at that stage, um, 
it was tied together in, in bundles um, of single fibres. <coughs> now, the spinning process uh, took over from there. Yeah. And I'm a bit uncertain from there on. So how was the finished product like? Was it something like the woolen uh, material? <coughs> or would it be there that again, close? There again, uh, you see, when they were spinning, they could spin a heavy thread or a light one. Oh, yeah. Depending on what they wanted to use yeah. it for. Yeah. Now, for towels and sheets and things like that, yeah. they had a fine thread. Yeah. The thing I forgot to mention earlier now is about um, dyes, natural dyes that they used to use for the wool. Um, and uh, I see here uh, in a magazine they talk about logwood dye. There was also a dye that they used to make out of um, certain herbs and lichens and things, um, depending on the colour. Black was the one that was mostly used. There are a number of others as well. Uh, also, we forgot to mention about um, homespun suits, you know, clothing, clothing of various kinds. Uh, <coughs> Bornean would be a kind of a cross between a waistcoat and, uh, uh, and a coat. So it wasn't uh, the material though? Uh, well, yes, the, the, um, sometimes <coughs> the front, the part of it that would be seen, would be shop cloth as they used to call yeah. it. And the rest of it then would be made out of the woolen or out, out of the homespun. Oh, yeah. um, <coughs> And um, the elbows would wear, so the sleeves could be replaced. The back would wear too, <coughs> if they were carrying turf or uh, <coughs> anything else. And <coughs> in fact, there's a wish about long life. <coughs> May you live so long that the skin of a gooseberry would make a back for your waistcoat. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, this this was it called a waistcoat or a shan vest in those days? Did they call them vests? Well, the, the, the best was the ordinary, was the ordinary waistcoat. Oh, ah, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. But um, <coughs> the Bornean, I think they used to, the, the, it was what they used to call sleeved waistcoat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, there's a little description here now. The back and sleeves were of grey flannel, six buttons in front, and they are said to have been a nice, warm, tidy garment. Um, <coughs> then, the suits, especially for uh, for boys and young men, they were made also by um, a local tailor. <coughs> now here again we're on to uh, a new idea. <coughs> Tailors had apprentices and to kind of qualify and uh, get out of their apprenticeship uh, and become a fully qualified tailor they had to go through this stage of being journeyman tailors yeah. <coughs> and usually they went round and they stayed in the house. Now they picked a house where there weren't kids because if there were children that did they'd, they'd, um, be looking at their patterns and maybe uh, losing their needles and, and right. thread and yeah. so on. So <coughs> anybody who wanted a suit made, they brought the makings, uh, including the trimmings. Now that would be uh, back uh, linings, buttons, thread, all the rest of it. And um, then they made a bargain uh, with the tailor. And <coughs> usually when the tailor was at work, um, it, it was a kind of a holiday period because he had all the news of the countryside with him <coughs> and in the evenings when the work was finished uh, there was maybe music or there would be storytelling or something and certainly they would have got information from the journeyman tailor. <coughs> now a lot of the tailors um, might have been people who uh, had broken legs or uh, maybe weren't very healthy yeah. <coughs> and this was a job that didn't require a lot of physical strength yeah. and um, some of the tailors also had a reputation for being short-tempered. That's right. Uh, <coughs> I've heard about that too. <laughs> um, then <coughs> they went around with a, a big smoother iron, which they used to call a goose. I think that was because of the shape of the, uh, of the handle at the top. Yeah. Uh, it was like a goose's neck. Yeah. That was a heavy one for pressing. Was he yeah. called Johnny Menno because of all the travelling he did? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then you had journeyman carpenters as well. <coughs> they went oh, from yeah. place to place. Well, uh, yeah. There would be one house in the village who would operate and until he had all the village uh, uh, clothes. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, in some cases, uh, I would say um, a man with a growing family, <coughs> they, they, their clothes would wear, would wear all quicker. And he could have stayed with them. But if he could, he picked a house where, um, <coughs> as I said, there wouldn't be children to interfere with his work. Yeah. And when he could patterns, or there would be mis mislaying things, or yeah. losing yeah. them, yeah. or so forth. Yeah. Another thing also that we forgot to mention earlier was this um, thing about quilting and <coughs> that was usually a kind of a community exercise as well and the women of the neighbourhood came in and 
it was a slow and tedious and an expert job <coughs> and if you see some of the some of those quilts might still survive <coughs> and the the uh, the sewing is expert uh, they prided themselves on being able to make all the stitches of equal length and the stitches were done crisscross <coughs> now um, I'll quote this a little bit from the article I mentioned before quilts were made from flannel dyed red this was packet dye sold in shops three or four widths, widths were sewn together backed with an old blanket usually and quilted every village had a quilting frame a couple of women would sit at it, stitching the two thicknesses together in a zigzag fashion. A girl getting married always got bedclothes, blankets, a quilt, bed linen, towels, etc. to take to her new house. This was called the Bag of Auras. That's, that's you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This was written by, um, what's her name again? Oh yes, uh, Liz Hagerty. She's Canon Wilds' housekeeper. That person? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and she comes from <coughs> and she'd have gone to the trouble of checking every single item of that. Oh, yeah. mm. This is in the um, Ballycastle Parish magazine. Very good. Fowl, named after the Underwood, or under the wood. 428 acres and there's a, a spot where St. Patrick was supposed to have met the four fishermen and here is a giant's grave and there's the road that runs through Fohill Cross the one that goes on to Banagher and this is the road that comes down from uh, Placed and touring down towards the strand, running right through Fohill, and there is the strand where the Clunalhan River enters itself. Tabernaray, King's Well or Queen's Well, the Standing Stone called that, Balbrini, and Tabernagreve, the well of the palms or the branches. And here is the Lachine, burial place. Fohill, the town land named under the wood and this is upper Fohill this fence running down here to the right is the boundary the southern boundary running way over there to the east There are some of the houses in Fohill Upper. Now a fourth, or this one, this road runs through a fourth, which is an unusual thing. And there we see another fort, but it's not in Fohill. The wall there is the boundary. Runs away down there. And then it turns right when it meets the stream, way down at the townland of Clonalhan. There's a view of the Fohill Marsh. And this is a view from the townland of Clonalhan. The river runs across here, right of that is Fohill, Fohill Marsh. And there's the Fohill, uh, the Clonalhan River, right of that is Fohill, Fohill Marsh. And down there is the mound where the St. Patrick met the Fohill fishermen. And, uh, he asked him for a salmon and he told him he'd give him the next one. And the next one was bigger and he told him he'd give him the next one. Finally, after three salmon, St. Patrick was supposed to have thrown a stone into the river and said that no more salmon would be caught in this river until that stone was washed ashore. It happened, we are told. Tradition has it down on this mound here. Now, 
Now, left of that river is Kiligiri, Kiligiri Marsh, and in the background is the ruins of Castellacan. <coughs> And here's the river where it all happened. Probably St. Patrick's first landing place in this area. Now this is an area here for sheep raising. This marsh area, rushy area. Donohan describes a uh, quote from the Irish word for while meaning underwood. In 1838 this townland was uh, had uh, 439 and a half acres and was owned by J. Burke of Baranaya. He let it to tenants at 50 shillings an acre. 160 acres of this was uncultivated, probably the marsh down there. There were 47 families living in this townland, all in poor condition. It was in the parish of Kilcommon. In 1856 The immediate lesser was Sir W. Roger Palmer Baronet. The tenants were Anthony O'Hara, Patrick O'Hara, Bridget Kelly, Martin Jordan, Catherine Jordan, Martin O'Malley, Patrick Cooper, Anthony Duffy, Bridget Mehdi, Sir William Roger Palmer Baronet had a cottage here and no land. Patrick Malley, Andrew Malley, Thomas Malley, James Bradykin, Michael Hoban, John Tierney, Thomas Kearney, Anthony Reeve, Michael Gillespie, William O'Hara, Anthony Morton, Nicholas Collins, Michael McHale, Martin McNulty, Patrick Taha, Thomas McHale, Nicholas Collins, Honor Collins, Michael Gillespie, Bartholomew Finerty. Nicholas Collins again. He had a pound here. Bridget Hughes, Anthony Kelly and Nicholas Collins. Now some of these tenants' names occur over and over again. There were 65 tenants here in 1856. They probably moved in during the famine times to get fish, cockles, sand eels, shellfish, they settled down by the strand on the seashore when food failed them wherever they were in townlands close by because there were only 47 <coughs> families here in 1838 and 65 in 1856. Some of them I think also were brought in by Reverend Peter Neary. Uh, the present day map shows four hillers having 428 acres. It must have lost some Now we're looking down at from Fohill four Upper. This is Fohill Cross Rose and the left here was McHale's where Dr. McNulty used to have a clinic. On the right here was Early's, the Carpenters. And on the left here, as we turned down, was the Collins's Forge. Now we're going down to what is called Tubbery near Frank Lachnys. In its water, Donovan says St. Patrick is said to have baptized King Auley and 900 of his people. Down here to the right. Tubbery. And that's it, right there. In pretty bad condition today, polluted. Condition today, polluted and filthy. Which one? This one and that one. The two big ones there. Yeah. They were the rocks that were around us. Yeah, sure you have everyone taking me. No, tell me, was uh, was it you that did that job on the well there? No. Who did it? it was Pat Murphy. Oh, Pat Murphy. Did the villagers use it for spring water or they what? They did. It was used now for spring water. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you have all the pipe water now, haven't you? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you that if that was clean, then clean and see. That used to dry these late years. Did it? Used to. Yeah. Water store. It is sure like. Yeah. So they were the three that made up the well. They were the three that were around here in the circle. Yeah, yeah. And that, that wasn't... There was one within there, and there was one here, and there was one out here. Yeah, yeah. And this wasn't around here on the wall, and there. 
This wall, this wall wasn't doing it at all. Ah, so I know, that was, that was a later addition, wasn't it? But, uh, they're doing up that. It was about down to that. Yeah, yeah. But there was an old house there, there was a house room, a man named Morton living there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Timber post there. Yeah. I'm not sure now what it's called. A pound or not? A pound or not. But I asked not to You did? I did. So it was around then? Oh, it was somewhere around here. Yeah. And then there. Barely the castle top. That's right. Up here. Up there now. Where the... the, the uh, Up above the, well, the white wall is. Yeah. That's where he, the captain was. What's on the other side of the road? He was on the left hand side doing up. Oh yeah. It'd be in there. Yeah. And down here is the site of uh, Collins' Ford. That's where the Ford is now straight from in the pole there. Yeah. And now we'll see the side of the road. Yeah. You and then the pound. The pound was supposed to be around there, at the yeah. that hollow. And uh, further down then was uh, Hoban's where the... Uh, Hoban's the tailor then was down further. Yeah. And still further down Magaruri came from it, did it? Yeah, me, me all good, yeah. This is John Malius. Would he be below John Malius? If you understand, he'd be below John Malius, that, that what you see has changed. It has. Would he be below Frank Murphy's? No, but I tell you, like, for you to say to Frank Murphy's now. There's a little road going to the right. Going up. Yeah. Well, he'd be up there now on the right hand side, about middle way. He'd be, he wouldn't be all, they wouldn't be living all together now with his mouth and panels. Yeah. Do you know yeah. that? There's the site of the old forge, the Collins' forge. And up here on the left was Pat Haley, the carpenter, and further up on the left was uh, Mary Lynn, the dressmaker. <coughs> now we're going down to Fohal Lower, and uh, on the right of this bush of briars here was the pound owned by Nicholas Collins, in here to the right. Now, here on the right is one of the Collins' houses. This village was all Collins' at one time, carpenters and blacksmiths. In Fohal Lower now. And this house here was uh, Hoban's. There were tailors somewhere around here. And this house here uh, is not a hotel, it's, uh, it's a residence belonging to the Collinses. At the back is the last of the Collins uh, blacksmiths, John. And on the left here was a carpenter, Collins also, Mike. Now this was the O'Malley house, so where the O'Malley's were, well it was to the left of this, they were uh, masons. Also joined onto the old house was the Makururi house. Both houses joined on together around this corner here. Now uh, in front there, as we're taking the turn, was another well that supplied the whole village. Or the lower part of the village. Now we're moving on the road, a new road that was made in uh, about 1940, going over to Karen Thrasna. On the left here is Connors. And on the right in here, well on the left now as we're looking at it, was where Mark Rory lived. Somewhere, built onto that new house or near it, down there. Now this road here is a relatively new road going on to uh, Cadden Trasna. Down there is Lac Balbini. That Marcus has been here already since the Battle of Lashkin in 1975. And over here is Tubber the Grieve, the Well of the Branches. The Blessed Well, St. Patrick's Well. Now down here is the Lishin. You see the amount of stones around forth of some type or another. Just south of the Blessed Well. And uh, it was a burial ground, we see a tombstone there. People were buried there, I think infants were buried there that were unbaptized. Maybe big people were also buried there.
and here in front of it is another kind of mound. I don't exactly know what this one is, or what it was about. Maybe a crumb black of some type or another. boundary wall goes up here somewhere up to the right there, I think it's that stone wall that goes away up there and here's another mound uh, yes, there's one across this fence here Now this area down here is important in Lacken because this is where St. Patrick was supposed to have first started his mission around here. And this area here was supposed to be a wooded area all up as far as Palmerstown Bridge. Both that well there at Frank Lachnes. You were telling me there about... Uh, it took water out of the oil for putting on uh, tires. Yeah. Today, and it'll be dry, in the pot, be dry tomorrow. Even though there was plenty of water? No right? matter how plenty of water is dry. Right? Uh, how scarce it'll be? No, it makes no difference, it's dry. It's a dry? Good. Good. Yeah. Good. So that wasn't the, the well at all for the village? No. For, for the village above you's water. Right? Yeah. They use. Oh, the, 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 the water for the village below came from that well there? Just below here. Yeah. Right. What about this tunnel we're talking about in there? The tunnel? Yeah. Oh, the tunnel is there in uh, St. Martin Connors now, I would say. Yeah. I often went back myself a small, but I'd be, I'd be afraid to go back in. So you, you go up the road here and you find the little bridge? Yeah. Just on just the other side of the bridge and then yeah. cross in. And yeah. You're only about a hundred yards from it. Is it down the field straight then? Yeah, down the field straight. Oh, uh, would that be the mound of stones? That's yeah, that's where the, where the old heap of stones is. Oh, good, good, good. I was looking for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Fowl has changed now since you were a young fellow, hasn't it? It's changed Fowl since I was small. Yeah. Was there as many sheep in it as what there is today? No, no. No, no. Very little sheep. Yeah. Very little sheep. And well, the two houses were fashioned out of them. Yeah. Goodness sake. Gables, gables. Gables, gables. One gable was one to... Was one to... Well, yeah. well, well, well. The two rooms was beaten. <coughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. So this is where he, he was That's born and raised. Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's no very well sure. Do you remember what his father's name was? Uh, Shorter. Shorter. Yeah. 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 And he had, had he had brothers and sisters too? He, he had, he had. Ah. There you do. Five ten now. But he had two brothers more. Yeah, he four, four. John Ryder. Sean Ryder. Sean. Sean Mopper. Ah, yeah. 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 Well, he used to come on holidays then. Oh, he come. used them very often. Is that? Uh, yeah. From Phil and mm -hmm. Pat used to come down on. Pat wasn't there, me, you know, and he used to have a rifle, we used to be down there at the strand, shoot with the rifle. Oh, yeah. I got yeah. to yeah. You don't oh, remember yeah. the last time he came down, do you? I don't know. Fifty years mm -hmm. ago? Ah, oh, it is. Well, oh, it is and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have that house built fifty years, and yeah. he didn't come down here since. Ah, I see. Uh, mm -hmm. We got it, we had, we got that, the two gap, you know, and then we threw the whole house out. Yeah. Ah, yes. Well, did, so the daughter, did the daughter ever come? He had a daughter, I believe. Well, I, I, I must see the well, daughter. he used to come with them, like? No. Mm. Well, ah, no. yes. But she was in it, I heard. Ah, yes. Yeah. 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 Say that, yeah. right. She did, surely. Uh, yeah. One of them was his mother, wasn't they? Yes, yes. She was Nancy, Cooper. Nancy Cooper. Yes, yes Nancy, Nancy Cooper. That's right. Miss yes. Padden, I think, he, cause he said the name of the teacher. Did you ever hear of her? No, I didn't. It seems to, she was teaching somewhere well, here, well, anyway, she, I think. Well, she was being banal, she was teaching. I, th I think he said Toreen, but I wouldn't Turin. be sure. Yeah. Well, the old Cooper man, uh, her father would have a school for a short time up in Toreen. You didn't ever hear of that, did you? I didn't. No. I, didn't. I, no. I never heard about the school in Toreen. No, but no. there was three schools back there. Was there? 
But mm -hmm. the school was changed, and this is the third place to say now. I see, I see. <laughs> well, well, well. Well, the hall is, there was one. Well, uh -huh. The side of the hall, the side of the pub. There was yeah. another school there. That's, right. ah, that's yes, where the old school was. That's where they all went to school, and that old... The side yes. of the, uh, ah, the pub. Yes, the old that's where McRory went to, was it? <laughs> yeah. But you couldn't say nothing to him. Only Irish, all Irish he had, you see. Oh, yes. He, oh, he, yes. he used to have a copy of stick with him. If he spoke a word English, he'd kill you. Is that it? Oh, you'd want to be gone out of his way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Family, the marriage, they were tradesmen and builders, weren't they? Well, they were. He paid mm -hmm. up. Yeah, what was his name? Tom. Tom. Tom mm -hmm. O'Malley. Did he build many of the houses? Oh, well? he did, and the great. I'm still on Tom Warden. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did they build any big houses, like the parish priest house, or any houses or schools that oh, aren't they? they did. Which ones now? They've been... They've been Pat McLean's below on Barrow, that two stories. Good, story yeah. Any other one? Uh, they're a bit uh, modest about what the crossroads. Modest? That, uh, that uh, John Barrow has. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, his son, uh, Jim, yeah. and Johnny Hayes had built that. Yeah. But he was alive. He was alive that day. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sean, and then beyond the Omni Cash Lacken and yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. Did built, they? They built one house up to the Omni Cash Lacken and the mouth over there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you know so? And did I do? Two rulers, and did I do, yeah. 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 Thought he was. He was a captain of Shoreline. Merton and Mike. Yeah. yeah. Mike was his son. Wasn't there a captain to further up the road than Airlie? Uh, Merton Airlie. Or Pat, was it? Uh, Merton Airlie and uh, there was two of them. There was one of them was about an old man and the other was a young man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were up there near where Leonard is today. Just where they were. Just near where Leonard is. Yeah, yeah. That's where they were, Shoreline. Oh, so that's oh, he had. This is the cave back the road. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you had to stand up back in it. Oh, you wouldn't be able to stand up. But so you could go back no creeper like back in yeah. it a long way. Mm. Yeah. From here to the from here to the gate. Oh, they say it is unfair. I don't know. A long way fair. I'm not saying. Yeah. Going up there, the, you go, the road, you go back here of that hole there. Yeah. Mm. Yes, they say. How far down did they say it goes? Does it go down to the Lishin or down that direction? Well, it's the side of the Lishin. Yeah. yeah, but which direction is it going in? Up straight has come up. Up from the Lachine? Up, up from the cove at Sel It's coming up to the river, up that way. Oh, I, I don't see. know how it's a turn and turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's flags in it, it's built. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, flags yeah. in it, could be class overhead, and built yeah. up with stones. Is there a floor in it? Yeah. No, so, well, there's a great of small stones back in it, you know. Yeah, mm. there's no flagged floor, no? No, oh, no, you wouldn't get the flagged floor at all, sure. And it's not yeah. wide? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. You could creep it, it, you could creep it, it easy. Yeah. Yes, it must be three feet wide, I Is it? Ah, yes. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. If it was the stone second out, it's very deep. Oh, is it? Well, it is, yeah. it is. How far did it go back in? 20 years? Uh, well, about 20 years. Was well, it getting any deeper then? Could you stand up on a rant and no? Well, you wouldn't be able, no. Yeah. And I didn't back it, out. It, it's, uh, well, it was back fair, it got a bit narrow behind. Yeah. Mm. But I used to have a dog and he used to go back. When he'd be gone, he'd be gone. Half an hour. <laughs> 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 well, there used to be rabbits going back in it. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. Which direction do you think it was going in? It's coming up straight, Sean. Up straight from where it is. For the river? For the river. Okay. Mm. Up for the road. Okay. Mm. This one was here in the village. The Blessed Wild? Yes. Mm. That could well, be the... That was it on that hill, well, you know. Down there at the corner. Well, that, yeah. that well down there at the corner is supplying uh, water for you, isn't it? Well, for the, it was doing 15 houses before they... Boat for, for water, that's right. Was it? There's yeah. no one top of water now, Father. I know. Should, yeah. But it, it's pretty, it wouldn't be cleaned up and the pump was rolling or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's better than the one that was up there at, uh, mm -hmm. at Lachnay's, wasn't it? Oh, it never dried. Yeah. Oh, never yeah. dried. And this is cold as cold. Yeah. For the butter making, they'd use it for the butter. Oh, yeah. butter. Yeah. 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 It was yeah. doing all that to house us now, Father. Yeah. 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 Twice your life. Tell me, was there any special name on the one up at Frank Lachnay's house? Have it no way? No? No. 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 He says he's 85 years old. Yeah. Like the other one, isn't it? Supplying water to the whole village. Uh, yes, I'd be very, very cool. 
In fact, they used to do that, I think, uh, sometimes for the butter making, <coughs> uh, to make sure that it was doubly cool. Draw the water in the evening, uh, and if the butter would, which is summertime especially, <coughs> in warm weather, if, uh, if the butter was uh, too soft to make it up, they'd wait till evening time, and then bring a can of water from the well, then to uh, <coughs> that is to inherit it. Yeah. Nihal McRory, Patrick Pierce's gardener, came from Fohan, from that house up there where it was situated a long time ago. He wrote a book about this area. He called it Le Lynn Moige, first published in 1944. His grandfather was Patrick Cooper, who was brought in by Reverend Peter Neary and got land in Fohan. He taught some kind of school in Bristol for a while. This is uh, Cooper did. English and Greek were the subjects before he moved into Killala. One of his daughters, Nancy, married George Rogers. Oh yes, John referred to him as Shorsha there. Yeah. Rory was one of their sons. He writes of four houses in his mother's time. Windows were tall and narrow, too small to let thieves come through. Yeos, that means yeoman soldiers, dressed as white boys, often raided tenants' houses. One night some of these yeos were assaulted by the real white boys, and two yeos were killed. Six white boys had to go on their keeping, as they say, to France. One of these was called Colonel Kane. In his house in his young days up here, uh, in Fohal, were pigs under the bed. Eight people lived in the house, healthy. Uh, there was a litter of banners at the foot of the bed. One cow and two calves were tied in the horse. The house was cleaned every morning. He claimed to be in air and spent their time on lack and strand away down here. Single combats, he says, were fought here. And he also talks of burials being way down there in that direction at the Green Hill. Uh, in 1641, Fohill belonged to Richard Philbin. 244, well almost 245 acres of it, according to Simington's book of survey and distribution. Down here, uh, he calls Trelshawn. It's a narrow place where people are able to cross by foot. Even when the tide is up, you can get across there. And he talks of Goldmark Moore fighting a big battle down there with uh, Jarrod Moore. This must be the same character that Paddy Caulfield writes about in his uh, Irish flower there on, on Belly Castle. Out of Down Patrick. Yeah, out of Down Patrick. Yeah. And that he was drowned out there. Well, McRory claims he was killed here and buried somewhere down there, maybe the Green Hill. Mm -hmm. Green Hill, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. So uh, was there any kind of an opening then, or it just that it fell in, it collapsed? Oh, no, there was a big opening, a very big opening, but some man heel stones in the opening, you see. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the opening yeah. was going down into the ground, wasn't it? No, there was a good slope at that time, a yeah. good slope, you see, yeah. in front of the opening. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. he healed it, he healed it all, all the stones into the... It must be nearly all filled up now, so the way down there. No, it's going down now. Well, I could pass me now, and I didn't even look. I need to pass that way now. Yeah. Tell me, could you stand up when you went back in it? Ah, you wouldn't know. No. Yeah, you wouldn't know. Oh, it would be three or four feet high. Three feet high. Well, it would be three feet anyway. But yeah. I don't know how was it further back. There were mm. people that went back further than I did, you know. Yeah. And there was no little rooms or little caves or oh, little... I'm not sure who there, anyone didn't go that first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be afraid yeah. Yeah. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there ever a fort anywhere out this side of it? Fort? No, yeah. only the fort that found it. Oh, there's a fort there. I, I know him. Do you see the cock of hay now behind? Oh, yeah, on the well, fair end. It broke down. Well, I'm out of here, careful, didn't it? Yeah. It broke down now, the field the size of the, the cock of hay. Yes. Oh, well, I know it. I'd say it'd be to the left of the cock of hay. I know it, I know where it is. I... Uh, careful, didn't it? And, and there was the same like that, it was the same lead. The same tunnel. The same tunnel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right yeah. he, he closed up that about two years ago. Well, I, did yeah, I? He did. I seen it when, the, when it was open now. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, I, I, I would be doubtful about that, you know, that's about that far. But maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I don't know, they'll tell you that they will. They met out the one over there in Castletown was leading a long way. Yeah. yeah. But I just say, I see people were afraid to go back in. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. But but how would you get a flash lamp that thing? That's right. Oh, he wouldn't. Hmm? Yeah, he wouldn't. That's right. Yeah. That's in the machine. Yeah. 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 No big people. No. No. No, no big no. people. 
Yeah. There was a, I seen a few stones standing in it. There is a headstone in it, all right. There was a few, but was there? the same as the gathering off the land, you know, the stone from people that seed land. They were banking it. Now this is the fort, that's where the tunnel is. And there's a little fort here. We can see the extent of it. Built up with rocks, piled in by the people of the land. The outer edge of the fort, I think. <coughs> you can see down there the, the beginning of the escape passage. <coughs> now, the, the, the construction of this one is a bit unusual. It goes out here, uh, it would have gone through that fence out the other side to complete the circle. <coughs> but then when you come inside here, there's another wall <coughs> which is about two feet wide and it curves away to the right here and <coughs> you can see part of it on the other side <coughs> you, can, you can see the curve there where it curves away to the right <coughs> now there's a depression down there uh -huh, and that could be part of the uh, escape chamber where the roof has collapsed <coughs> another possibility except that uh, it doesn't exactly fit uh, <coughs> it looks like the wall of a lime kiln <coughs> that somebody in later years um, started to burn lime uh, on top of this lishing which again would be most unusual uh, <coughs> because people had a kind of a superstitious respect for them and they thought there were places where the fairies lived <coughs> and the less you had to do with them the better yeah. this is what they call the tunnel yeah, yes. um, and from a man now who was down in it um, <coughs> he said it was about uh, four feet high or maybe three to four feet high same width <coughs> covered over with big flanks yeah. um, and he said it went for the wolf for, for the river yeah. well that would make sense if it's an escape passage the first thing they'd run short of was water <coughs> and that was the usual thing uh, <coughs> in these farmers houses uh, yeah. that if they were attacked by say by wild animals <coughs> or other people uh, if they were besieged uh, <coughs> they had a secret way uh, down for water yeah. Would we have to pick up? <coughs> there's a line running down there um, through the field. Uh, halfway over, then there's another one. Over in the other patch, uh, there's also another one. <coughs> and these would be the divisions uh, between the sections of Rundin. Those are what they call the quee lodges. Yeah. Uh, and <coughs> you can see them there. <coughs> now, on a sunny day, they come out better. Yeah. So this is all a Rundin quee lodge, that's it. Um, down yes, here. All of this line, yes. Uh, was divided. And I think in the other field you can see another one. You can see another, another one runs down here. Yes. yes. And they would be there, I'd say, from <coughs> before some of those fences were made. Well, over here is Lichine, and there's the remains of another one over there. Yeah, so that's <coughs> three of them within about 200 yards. And some say that the tunnel from here goes over in that direction. Oh, and far out towards the cock of hair, left of that house there on the top of the head. To be up there on that truck. <coughs> well, that is me checking again. Oh, indeed. And we do now. Uh, you have four hills. <coughs> and you can see two clusters of houses uh, the upper village uh, and the one lower down. And <coughs> it's a very ancient name. Uh, and <coughs> it gets its importance from the fact that it, it's um, mentioned in uh, St. Patrick's Confessions. Uh, well, that's the name of the document that he wrote. <coughs> there are two genuine documents concerning St. Patrick. Uh, one would be this is confession, and the other one would be the, the letter to Karatika. And um, I'd like to quote you here now from <coughs> an article by Bishop MacDonald, uh, out of the confession. <coughs> there, that's after his escape to Britain, quoting, I saw in the night the vision of a man whose name was Victoricus, coming as it were from Ireland with countless letters, and he gave me one of them. And I read the opening words of the letter, which were the voice of the Irish. And as I read the beginning of the letter, <coughs> I thought that at the same moment I heard the voice of those who were beside the wood of Falkland, which is near the western sea. And thus did they cry, as though with one mouth, we ask you, holy youth, to come and walk among us once more. <coughs> now, there's more written uh, about Silva Falkland, uh, and... <coughs> 
or would it turn into uh, at least half a dozen different uh, interpretations? <coughs> what we can say about it is that there's an ancient tradition which goes back a long, long way uh, to say that it was from here <coughs> that, uh, that St. Patrick heard the voices of the Irish. <coughs> now, part of the puzzle is when he said, come again and walk among us, which he inferred <coughs> that he had been here before. Yeah. Now, <coughs> if he uh, was a slave uh, at Schlieve Mish, uh, it's difficult. I don't know how you would answer that one. And again, uh, <coughs> these are where the answers come, and, and they're different. Now, <coughs> where he uh, was captured uh, and where he lived as a slave, even where he was born, uh, it, all those are disputed questions. Yeah. Well, now, the, the heights over Fohel there were supposed to be wooded, <coughs> because Fohel is named as Underwood, Fohel, so that would be the height. True. Well, <coughs> in fact, some would say that the whole area from here to Kalala, past Kalala, out by Frostpatrick, that all of that was a wooded area yeah. uh, of ancient oak. And, and had blades in and out here and there, breaks in the forest, wasn't that? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, well, yeah. uh, that could be. But, uh, as I say, the, the, the question is rather complicated. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like Shakespeare said, now, wasn't it he, that um, fools rush in somewhere, <laughs> sometimes, where angels fear to tread. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of angels on this ground. Yeah, well, some of them are, uh, as you mentioned there, uh, Bishop Thomas MacDonald, and there's a man called Bewley and Curley and <coughs> O'Reilly and Hanson that have followed their theories on St. Patrick and Silver for Cootie and uh, mm. Ackle, isn't it? Uh, <coughs> yes. Oh, um, yeah, as I say, there are, you named at least <coughs> six names there, and each one has his own. Yeah. Uh, and that's not all of them. Well, you're there supposed to have escaped too from Kilala, isn't it? Well, <coughs> there again, you see, <coughs> it depends on what you mean by the Western Sea. Some of them would claim that, <coughs> having been born in uh, England or Scotland, that for him the Western Sea would be the Irish Sea. Yeah. Now, maybe, maybe not. Well, he was on a boat, we read, mm -hmm. carrying greyhounds or dogs for the continent, and I believe Kerala <coughs> had a market for these in France or somewhere in those days, hadn't it? That's true. <coughs> but yeah. you see, there again, uh, the ones who don't agree with that uh, would say, why come this far west to go to France? that it would be much easier to go from Wexford or from that side of the country. So, uh, no matter what you put up, <coughs> there's an opposite side to it. Yeah. Uh, but <coughs> St. Patrick himself said, yes, uh, he escaped by ship. <coughs> there were dogs, there were greyhounds, yeah. uh, or wolfhounds, I suppose, uh, you'd yeah. say. Um, <coughs> now, it's absolutely certain that St. Patrick crossed the Shannon at least three times. Yeah, well, there was trade from Kilala too. Kilala was a uh, trading town even in those days. Yeah. Mm, yes, that's true. Right. Um, that's true. Uh, in fact, we could even venture further and say that long, long before St. Patrick's time, 2,000 years before that, <coughs> some of the first people to arrive in Ireland uh, came along that. the West yeah, Coast. Yeah. And there's evidence of that in some of the, the um, <coughs> monuments or artefacts and so on that they yeah. left uh, along here. Yeah. Um, like one of the professors who used to teach us uh, in Maynooth, <coughs> when he came to difficult subjects, <coughs> he'd say, gentlemen, we're in the bog again today. <coughs> and we are a bit in the bog now. This um, article uh, by Bishop MacDonald uh, is in the annual of the North Mayo Historical and Archaeological Society for 80, 1982. Um, <coughs> and he sums up there uh, something about the sources and the different people who had written <coughs> and the different views they had and their interpretations of what silver for, for Clutie meant. Um, <coughs> and there's about 15 pages in it. Um, <coughs> there's devotion to St. Patrick here. There's a holy well. Uh, there's a pillar stone, <coughs> a standing stone, uh, which goes back and was probably Christianized um, <coughs> after St. Patrick came. So the devotion to St. Patrick and the tradition, as I say, um, <coughs> the Western one is the oldest. Yeah, there's a lot of schools in that from two, I think. Uh, true. Yeah. <coughs> true. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we can sum it up as any of the others. Yeah. And it's older than one. This house here is uh, Farrell's, a Fohel. At the back of it was a shop that serviced the village for uh, the townland of Fohel for years and years. Here also lived in the 40s and 50s John Burke, who taught in Caramore Lacken National School and who also became a divisional inspector. Over there was an old house on the left where Dr. McNulty used to hold his clinics.
townland of Fohill goes away over here this road. It's both sides of the road. Now we've reached the boundary here. This is the ditch going up here, the fence. Over there is uh, Fohill. Here's the fence going up then, winding way out to the right here. And going across. And then turning left of that tractor there and out to the top of the hill. The tractor is in um, Cadden Thrasner. Left of the ditch is uh, Fohill, the townland of Fohill. And here we see the boundary on the other side, that ditch going away up there. On the right here is Fohill. On the left I think is Cashel. Townland of Fohill. Sedimentary rock. It's not limestone. No, no, it's, a, it's a not shale either, is it? It's sedimentary. Uh, it may be a very old, a very old rock. It, may, it could be a very old rock. It could be, in fact, uh, these could be less of layers of lava. The igneous rock from volcano. Yeah. Volcanic type. The volcanic type of rock. Yeah. Possibly or sedimentary. Is that the volcanic or sedimentary? I don't know where they got these stones because in, the, in my lifetime I've never seen, you know, a head of them in quarries getting them that limp. No, and uh, That's probably going down a few not feet. Not typical of the stone that you get around it. Here. Uh, there is yeah. a, a, a rock out crop which led to some of the seashore and my head could come in and right goes up right up to so it may well be that these stones uh, they were quarried in some some place, some maybe many miles away, too. Many miles away and Busy man Christianizing pagan and uh, I don't think he would personally be too bothered about putting up stones to commemorate what he did. If it could be done by maybe some of us there. Uh, yeah, well, if they, were, if they did, they'd have crosses or something now, there's some uh, Christian sign on, wouldn't they? I'm inclined to go for the ordinance survey. First Ordnance Survey was started in 1828 by, and the team here in this area was a man called O'Connor and a man called Donovan. Now Donovan was headquartered in Castle Bar or up there and O'Connor was a man in the field and it was known as the Down Survey. The reason it's called the Down Survey is the man who actually Donovan and uh, O'Connor were historians in their own right. I would say yes, there is a reason for these stones. And he associated them with battles fought and won or lost. And uh, he says in relation to this particular stone that it was to commemorate the defeat of the Danes. The Danes tried several over many years and uh, the Norsemen Vikings tried uh, several, uh, made several attempts to gain a foothold in Ireland. Uh, and they them was here in Lacton Bay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the date he gives, or somebody gives, I'm not sure now, a recollection that says many years since they read it, was uh, about uh, 985, maybe 25 years before from Tar. Yeah. Uh, there about. And that the stone was put up to commemorate the defeat of the day. Yeah. Uh, and that battle. And he, O'Connor, gives no uh, 
way at all to the theory that it's in any way associated with St. Patrick's Missionary Activity. Yeah. So, uh, that was called the Battle of Lacken, wasn't it? Yes. No. There's also a burial ground way down here. Yes, well, he, he, he refers to that in his letters and uh, his, the green. his theory was the one at Green Hill. Yeah. Uh, in those days, they were quite chivalrous uh, in battle. They call a truce to bury their dead. Yeah. At the end, they, maybe took, they probably took, they took hostages, the very likely of the day, and let them go home about their business. Yeah. And the hostage was kept as, as a guarantee of them. So they buried... Uh, one group, the uh, Rains Dormitory on the parish, buried in the Green Hills. On the other side, buried over in a place called uh, Puller Ribble, which is out on the head of Kilcommon there. It is, yeah. Uh, a skelp. Uh, uh, that's a, a theory. Or, uh, that's more than a theory, because I have I've seen the red stand. And they were burial ground, undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, but whether it's, uh, it's whether the, the, the burial kind of from the, the people killed in, in, uh, in battle here. Yeah. The battles in those days would be a pretty bloody affair. Yeah. It was an uh, axe and sword and sword and knife. Yeah. 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 Uh, with the, the battle of Lacken, the, the bury, two burial grounds are tied yeah. in. Yeah. And with the... With For information from an old Mrs. Franklin there, but she wasn't too uh, accurate. She said that she thought that uh, it was the bodies of invaders coming in here that were defeated that were buried down there at the Green Hill. Now, she hadn't heard of Donovan nor of that other man you mentioned. Yes, O'Connor. No, O'Connor, yeah. Yeah. What? From the well is here. The uh, well is in pretty dark condition, isn't it? It is. It's uh, something needs to be done with it. Yeah. Why, like, proper exception? Uh, no, okay. I don't know whether they got them to baptize each other, but it seemed an awful job for uh, one man to baptize 1,500. Yeah, well, of course, day. could he get them to submerge themselves in the water, maybe? Well, that's uh, possibly that. I suppose, much the same as uh, our, our Lord in the Jordan. Yeah, uh, mass baptism. Ma a mass baptism. Yeah, yeah. 1,500, I'm supposed to be baptized there. Within the, within the principality of the Enders, who was given this principality and who brought uh, St. Patrick here, and all Enders' followers were Christianized by St. Patrick. Yeah. St. Patrick was a good politician. He used the princes in order to get out of people. And he got the prince himself. You no trouble getting the people. Well, of course, if he lived around here, that would come easier to him if he had been a prisoner for three years or a slave or whatever, you know, that might have come a lot easier to him. Yes, certainly it would have, uh, he would have developed this, uh, an opportunity of thinking out his, uh, his tactics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he would have a great advantage, wouldn't he? Supernatural influence could have been walking there anyhow. Yeah. Uh, which would have been reported from here. I've never heard of any, but there's been a, it's a great faith by a number of people in the United States. A great faith in the United States. I know I'm meditation off early here in the last week. Yeah. There has been an odd one reported from Kid Cummins, you know. Yes, uh, 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 the paint list, you say, yeah. Kelly, uh, stood up pretty well. I thought 20 years ago it would collapse any time. And I'm a bit disappointed that there isn't greater enthusiasm in having it. 
Yeah. 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 I'm not a person to agree with everything that other people say, but I, 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 I think it's unimportant whether St. Patrick was heard at swine over here or above in our Antrim, it doesn't matter. But it's certain that he commenced his missionary career here. That's pretty well authenticated. That when, when endless son, when, when Auli was on the point of death, and he was dividing up his principality, he couldn't get agreement of his son as to the division. But he got them to agree to accept the decision of the High King of Ireland, who was a relative of theirs. Yeah. And they agreed to that on the journey to Tara. And while they were at Tara, St. Patrick lit the path of fire into the plain, the plain, in the plain of the St. Patrick came across to Tara, and when he was at Tara, he met Enda, and they recognized each other. In other words, they had met him. Whether that's what happened here, or whether it happened in, in Antrim, where Enda might have been in fostage with his uncle, I don't know, but it's not important. But Enda brought him here, he commenced his like, missionary activity here, and he's that. Captain Tressler, the quarter crossways, or the crossways quarter, could also mean contrary people, I suppose. Uh, Chalk Trasner here, coming across one another. Well, Donovan has it down as the crossways quarter, and here we see it. <coughs> now that's uh, Upper Cadden Trasner, Cadden Trasner, and uh, Lower Cadden Trasner, out on the north side. This is a contour line 100 feet over sea level. And this is the southern tip of the um, townland at um, Castle Lake. And there's the road going through to Banhill. Now, this, uh, there's no road here, but there is one now. There's one. The, this one is not on the map. It goes on to the present road and down into uh, Banhill again. It was made. Uh, 50 years ago. <coughs> now that Cash Lake down the south, southern corner is also called Banner Lake locally. That would roughly be the uh, direction of the present day new road as they call it that comes up here. Now that's Lacken Strand on the west side. Crosswise quarter. And this is what it looks like. Now the fence that goes away, uh, this is the road, it's both sides of the road. Well, when we go over there a few yards, see that ditch there on the right? It goes away down to the right. It's Karen Trasnet in both sides of the road there. <coughs> This is looking ahead from the east side, looking west. And there's the boundary that drained there. And on the right there where these reeds are grown was once Cash Lake, or as the people call it, Banhur Lake, I believe. That fence running there through the bushes away over towards the road is the townland boundary. Now, uh, coming across the road here, Now going up there, uh, left of that is, or that drain going up there is the townland boundary between Banagher and Cadden Trasna on the left, Cadden Trasna on the right, Banagher. That's what the country looks like. Now this is the new road up by Collins's on the left. Um, it's about 50 years old. This would be Upper Cadden Trasnet, this village here now we're looking at. Most of the houses that were in it in 1838 are not here now. 
and over there on the right was a quarry. I think they used to call it Quarry Hill. Stones came from there. We see the wreckage of old houses or the remains of them. People have immigrated from here and changed up around Palmstone and Mine. This was the new road built. It is down as uh, Cabin Trasna. O'Donovan of 1838 survey has it down as the Crosswise Quarter coming from Trasna. In 1838 it contained almost 230 acres. Since the last revision the acreage has increased to 237 acres. This townland also included over three acres of water which was down there uh, in Banagher Lake or Cash Lake as it should, it should properly be called. Half of Cash Lake. Uh, this lake was known locally as Banner Lake. In 1838 it was the property of Richard Irwin, who was living in Dublin. His agent was George Irwin of Greenown, Ballinae. Uh, 33 farmers and 6 cottiers lived here in 18, around 1838. They grew oats and potatoes. Carol was in the south of the village. Well now, down there is uh, Upper Carol Here is the village. Behind me here is Cabin Trasna, and farther down is Lower Cabin Trasna. Three villages in the townland of Cabin Trasna, all named Cabin Trasna. Uh, the villages are 100 feet over sea level. In 1856, according to the Griffith valuation, the uh, immediate lesser was Mrs. Erwine. The occupiers were Henry Robinson, Thomas Lotney, Lackey Munley, John Munley, Michael Munley, Lackey Munley, Patrick Murphy, John Lockney, Anthony Duffy, John Duffy, Michael Duffy, Anthony Duffy, John Duffy, Michael Duffy, John Munley, Michael Munley, Michael Collins, Patrick Collins, Bridget Ford, John Lockney, James Murphy, John McNulty, Patrick Murphy. 23 families. The number of families declined here by 10 during the famine years. Now, Michael Duffy that lived here in about 1856 had a pound here for caging up wandering animals etc. Uh, Cadden Trasna is also mentioned in Simington's book of Survey and Distribution. It had 108 acres in those days and it was owned by Richard Burke and McHugh and McDaniel, three uh, different kinds of people. The boundary wall down there now, isn't it? Yes. To the right down there, isn't it? Yes. All the way down as far as the road. Down as far as the road. And the caves are somewhere down on the hill there. Down on the hill here, yes. They call it Stairer to there. Stairer, yes. yeah. Now how about this other boundary that goes down here? It's um, one down to meet Carrickfield of Townland. Yeah. It goes all the way down to the stone wall. It goes it? down to the stone wall there. Can we see it from here? You can, see the stone wall just up here. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's the, 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 the um, pillar stone. Oh, yeah, well that's in the next townland, isn't it? Yeah, it's in, in, in Banagher townland. Yeah. I'm this now. All over here is... Yes. Now, do you want me to, oh, you to face the music? Mm. The roadway leading up there, that's where Pat Robertson originally lived, uh, my old footballer. Yeah. Supposed to have the longest kick and croak pair, longest free kick and croak pair. Well, it's still supposed to hold the record anyway. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That blue house down there. That blue house here, that was his original house. Well, it was the last one he was living in, the wasn't it? The last one he lived in. So the original one would be... The original one is just down here where the staples are. In fact, it's dark now, but it was there when it was Ah, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Now... <laughs> Now there's the townland boundary all the way down. No, that's where the caves are, Spoiler. And we're in the east, uh, the western now, looking down towards Lackenstrand, that drain there, as it moves down and winds down towards the statue on the strand, is the boundary between Fohill and uh, Cadden Trasna. Over here is Cadden Trasna, all the way as far as the stone wall, over there. Way over there. Of Townland and Kevin yeah. Tell us up here now. Um, that must was now it was. Originally it was Duffel. Yeah. Now it's must was. Come up there now it's Duffel. Yeah, they had the pound. Yes, the, the pound was here now and was owned by 
Duffy family. Well, Michael Duffy, that's down in the hill for Michael Duffy, he's the end. What a great grandfather lives. Present code now. Yeah. The Mothwee. Yeah. Family. Yeah. 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 It was a, a thing that you had to have water in the ponds. Cattle there, they weren't fed, but they weren't allowed to be thirsty. Yeah. They always had facilities to drink. Yeah. So, it was one of the things necessary to a pound. One of the things necessary. Yeah, one of the necessities of a pound. Yeah. 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 What was it for? Holding stray donkeys mostly, was it? Uh, yeah. Stray animals. And then the other thing, if, at the time, if a neighbor's animal went in in your field, well, you had the option of putting them in the pound. Yeah. And he'd have to redeem them, then pay so much on them to redeem them. And if he didn't, would they be fed or served or what happened? Uh, they'd be there for so long, and if they weren't claimed, they could be auctioned and sold. Oh, so I see. Nine days. Nine um, days, was that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh? That's pretty fine now. Oh, we'll say 20. This yeah. village up here? Yeah, this is um, Lower Cantra. known as Lower Cantra last night. Yeah. Part known in Irish as Yeah. Um, about 20 years ago, some of the last inhabitants left it. They built houses away up. Further up the village. Further up the village. Yeah. Built new houses. Oh, yeah, some of them immigrated up to different townlands up around Palmerstown, too. So, yeah, some of them yeah. Right cash. immigrated. Right right. Cash, was it? Some of them immigrated from right cash. And yeah. Yeah. The houses were like these. This yeah, one up here, they were attached. ordinary attached houses. Uh, room and a kitchen mostly. Some of, Dad wanted them two rooms and a kitchen. Yeah. Ordinary so all attached houses. There was no stated house at all at that time. As far up the village in here was Bailan Kampa, was that right? Uh, yeah, Bailan Bailan Kampa was further up. Yeah. Uh, no one in Irish has opened to get you the camera. That's the house of uh, Pat Robertson, Maliki Kern. Oh, this here is... Uh, well, you saw the cave, Jimmy, isn't it? This is the cave here. Known as All the theory here, is it? Yeah, known as Thayra. Yeah. And the incident for this cave, I came out first about ten years ago. Did you? And it was open. Yeah. And I went down into it. Yeah. And I went about three years over that way, or four years, say. And it was built on both sides, flagged on the bottom, flagged on the top. Could there, was no, there was no muck or anything, you know, concrete or anything, you know what I mean? Yeah. Could you stand in it? Stand no, up. no, it was on my hands and knees. Yeah. When I went back to the I got afraid of it. <laughs> Could you stand up when you went? Did it, was it the same? It was the same all the way, as far as I went, for three or four years. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they were turned. Yeah. Well, I came back again. But was anyway, it dry? Dry in the bottom? Dry in the bottom, dry in the top. Yeah. Uh, everything perfect. Clean well as a pin. Yeah. And I came back again, I was finally, about two years after that, an animal fell into it. So we turned around and took the animal out and that lump of stones and threw it into the road layer, as you see there now. Yeah. 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 yeah, the hole is there, all right. It's there. Something look at here, look at the building. Something there. I do, yeah. See the side of there. Yeah. Now this cave goes on this direction, towards the wall. Now this, looking at it here, it's a raised fortification. Uh, there seemed to have been some kind of a raised fortification here in the time gone by. It's higher than the rest of the land. Call Styra or the stairs, I don't know why. There seemed to be some um, fortification in that cave there. Would uh, account for an escape hatch. Now it goes out into the next field too, and the cave is supposed to go on down towards uh, the sea or over towards Kushtanagriha in that direction. Styra. Cash from the left to that. That's where my grandfather Yeah. Left of Kushlanagriha, is it? Yeah, at Kushlanagriha. It's to the left of Kushlanagriha, down probably five or six hundred years. That's where they think this cave comes out. Yeah, that's what we're. It's supposed to be. It was known as Lobby Gronia and Germa. Germa and Gronia were supposed to have a bed there. Where? Uh, Cushion of Greek, Cushion of McGee. Oh, down there? Yeah, in the old Cushion. Yeah. Good, because that's another uh, connection with the sea and now you found here. Yeah. 
You know, um, boys on a tool. This road here is called the New Road, isn't it, Paddy? Yes. yes. What year? 1932, is it? Between 30 and 32. You would say it was 27, 28, you know? 28. 28. Yeah, or yeah. well, sometime around then, anyway. Around 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 around. It's not mapped on the present day map. No. Yeah. This road here, though, to that, to that house book could be in the 32, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, from that on, it'll be 32. From, from, the, from that on, it'll be 32. This will be 27 or 28. Yeah. From here down. Yeah. This this road here now was only a path. Oh, it yeah. Was, it, this was a path. It was. This road here was originally a path. Yeah. It was used by the fishermen, by the, the whole Jandrasny village. Uh, at that time it was mostly fishing and farming. Yeah. More fishing than farming, the farms are small. Yeah. And it was used for going to that land, are mostly used for fishing. And going to church too, wasn't it? Going to church. Then, um, Belligeri people, the town land way back there, they used this going to church. Did they use it for going to the bog too? Going to the bog. Yeah. For Mostly the, the turfman listed their own bog they used yeah. it from. Here. Now, when they came to the cross, uh, to where the crossroads is today here, did they go up there and down the other? No, no, they went across the path here. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the path, the right-of-way here, see the steps there? The oh, that's the right-of-way all the yeah, way down? That, that's right the right-of-way right over, down all the way down to the, the strand, for going to, going to church. Oh, I see. You see, that's the whole right-of-way there. Oh, yes, yes. And yes. then there's another right-of-way above again. <laughs> that's a right-of-way, a very old right-of-way, map on the map, too. See the thoughts there? Yeah. yeah. From yeah. The, I see them, yeah. See the steps there. I'll go back at the old house. Yeah. At yeah. the side one of the old house behind yeah. there. Yeah. It's going to the, to the left, the left of the, the trees below, between the... Th you see where the sheep are? Yeah. Just right up at the bottom. Now, the well? Yeah. It's right here. Yeah. Known as Tubber and the Clyde. Yeah. Um, supplied water to the whole town and the Cairn Trassi, upper and lower. Yeah. Uh, tradition says the French came this way in 1798 and they drank from the well. And the well, the water was so cold as they called it the rock, the rock well, Tabernaclochia. Yeah, Tabernaclochia. Yeah. Now, Forge Village is down on that Forge country. Village is down here then. No. There was two forges there in that village. Yeah, we'll be down there later. Up yeah. here was where the French were camped. Up there on them houses, okay. Yes, up, up, the road, there, up on the, the, the height above where the fringe. So the they'd be coming down here to drink all right, wouldn't yes. they? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So that village up there now was called uh, Balian Kampa, wasn't Balian it? Balian Kampa. The town of the camps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people wouldn't agree that all the camps of the French were there, so they wouldn't. They no, were, no, no. They no. were scattered around at, uh, yeah. cloth, where was it, Crookmore and... Crookmore and, uh, and Bordabinia. And out at the head. Out at the head. Yeah. Now this here is the uh, Cadden Trasna upper, <coughs> one of the columns, and they had a forge up here where these two men are standing here. There were two forges in mm. Forge Village. Forge Village. Um, in Lower Cadden Trasna. Yeah, in the town land. Yeah. In the town land Lower Cadden Trasna. This was, um, forge was Tom Collins was the man that worked here, and it was a traditional handed down thing. His father before him and his grandfather all worked on the same forge. Yeah. Uh, there was another forge here now, just across the road here. Another pair of houses, I suppose they'd be distant relations. Yeah. They had another forge there, and there it was a traditional thing too. Yeah. So that's why this uh, part of the, to the uh, townland was called, townland was called um, Forge Village. Forge Village. You remember seeing this forge here? Yes, oh, I did. We often got our horses shot here. All the work we ever did was here. Yeah. You know? At that time, you deal with it with them, the one blacksmith. The, the man you, you went to, you kept on you going kept to on all the yeah. That forge was in there. You don't it? remember seeing the one that was in here? No, well, the, the, the walls were there, but I never seen any water on yeah. there. How long ago since this floor was in operation? It had been what, um, that would be roughly 25, 30 years ago. 25 or 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 Right. Quarry in here for house. Yeah, three stone quarry there. That there was stones quarry for houses. Both sides of the road, isn't it? Um, both sides of the road. Yeah. Village of Cadentrasna Lower. Cadentrasna Lower. Although it's higher than the one that's upper, isn't it? It's higher, and it's to the north of it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also called uh, a different name, isn't it's it? It's called Malihampa. Yeah. The French were supposed to have camped here in 1798 yeah. on their way to Tilala. 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 
No, the exact location of where the camp would be. Uh, back. Probably up here at hold back, yeah, up on the Whether up that green field up on the hill there. Where that white horse is in there. It's grazing, right? I can see him from here. Right, yeah. yeah, in there. That's where they can't throw like Yeah. Uh, this village has been peopled, I think, are inhabited by contrary people. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. The land, um, the houses were congested. The land was congested and there was a lot of trespass with fowl and geese and one thing and another and that caused a lot of friction among them. Well, they had a run deal to your town. It was all run deal. It was yeah. all, the whole town and was all run deal at one time. Yeah. Maybe uh, it's supposed to be called uh, the Crosswise townland, you know, situated Crosswise. Maybe it was because they were also contrary. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Probably so. Yeah. But then they weren't really that bad out here, though, were they? Uh, no, no. In other words, their back was a lot worse than their bite. When it came, when it came to a point, anyone got into trouble or anyone got sick, the whole village was in yeah. and helped out. In other words, when the crunch came, they were there. When the crunch came, they were even neighbors that weren't yeah. talking. They came in and helped us. Well, it was all it was all kind of petty stuff, though, well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now down here is the site of the the house where the year of the French. Yeah, the year made. of the French, where the eviction scene, where the eviction scene was. Yeah, one of the shoots for. Yeah, for the, the eviction scene. Yeah, down there. And. Uh, so was the house belonged to who? Uh, Murphy's. Belonged Lu to Murphy's. Loose to if you call him, was it? Yeah, man. What was his right name? Pat Murphy. Pat Murphy. Murphy. He was yeah. nicknamed Lewis yeah. Murphy. And yeah. that would be a house that looked exactly like the original houses that were here exactly, in 1790. Exactly, it was. Exactly. And everything inside the old dresser and the, the, the bed with the canopy over it known yeah. as the as Taster. Right, it was there. It was all there. The whole thing was there. As it was probably in 1790. And the hairness over the fireplace. And the hairness over the fireplace yeah. and yeah. the whole lot. The whole lot. Yeah. And the line over the fireplace. The fishing line over the, hung over the fireplace. Yeah. 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 And the beam at the end of the house. You know. So, the village of Cabin Cluster. We're back again at the quarry and looking up at where the caves were. Stayed and here is Ford's village, or Cairntrasna Upper. And there we have a scene from the year of the French, 1981, some of the makeup artists and the cast, and all the gear outside Pat Murphy's house. There we see the arc lamps shining on it, even though it was a bright summer's day. And here we see some of the RTE equipment and trucks and caravans for carrying their equipment around. And there are the camps set up to house the artists. 200 years almost after the French landed here, there were camps here about 200 years before, and there we see the situation of Pat Murphy's house down there, where the eviction scene took place. Here is more of the equipment being gathered by the Kalala police there. Once again, another look at Balian Kampa, camps in it the second time, 200 years later. Banahar, named after the pointed rocks or the pointed hills. 
which we find hard to find in this town land. And that's what it looks like there. And there's the road from um, Cadentras and the way over to Balagari and down to the coastline. This one comes down from Cashel. And that's the site of Old Banner School, built 1892. And uh, there's a road going up there called Doyle's Road or Doyle's Boating or Boher Doyle. <coughs> Here's the site of a fort and there's the site of a pound in the next townland, Balagari. <coughs> there was a village here and here's the site of the Standing Stone. And somewhere around there was the site of the first school or orig original school that was here. That's the contour line, 100 feet over sea level. There is the townland of Banhar. From that bridge forward, there is the drain, the boundary line, on the right of that, Banhar. On the left, I think, is Castle, and there again on the left, Banhar. That's the townland in the foreground. Banagher. According to O'Donovan, it comes from peaks, pointed hills, or pointed rocks. Well, they should be up there somewhere, but I have to find them. Pointed hills are the pointed rocks. It had almost 131 acres in 1838. It belonged to John and Charles Robinson. Uh, they lived up there in that, uh, right at the pool there, somewhere. And uh, who's, uh, um, this land was allotted to their ancestor uh, as a debenture in the Cromwellian confiscation. They lived in Banhar and sublet part of Banhar to tenants at 30 shillings an acre. It had 10 acres of uncultivated land and 8 acres of sand hills. Well, the uncultivated land would be over here, and I don't know exactly where the sand hills would be, probably at the far end of the townland. Uh, in 1856, the immediate lesser was Anne Gallagher. She had half of it leased. She subletted to tenants uh, Philip Lynch, Richard Welsh, Anne Gallagher, Anne Gallagher, that was herself, I suppose. She owned an old mill somewhere in the townland. I think it was over somewhere in that direction. Edward, Rob Edward Robinson owned half of this townland. He had a national schoolhouse. Now, the schoolhouse uh, would be over in that direction, I think. Now, according to the reports of the Commissioners of Public Construction, there was a boys' school and a girls' school somewhere around here, and Thomas Hoban was the master. Well, uh, this was the townland of Banagher, 1856. the boundary, crosses the road here, and away up right of this wall, way out the top of the hill. On the left is Cadden Trasna, on the right banner. <laughs> New house going up there, another one has been built over there, and uh, the public house that has replaced uh, the public house that was here belonged to Needham's or Lafferson's. This is the Kerry Man's Inn. Now, on the left of this drain is Bubba Gary, on the right is Anover, and down there at the bottom runs a river, and there is the remains of a 
Quando mi dà un'idea di parlare, 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 mi dà un'